I'd like to uh, call our meeting to order at 7 p.m. Um, would everyone please rise for the pledge of allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, and it is all with liberty and justice for all. All right, could you please uh, call the roll? Uh, here. Yes. Caroline? Here. Here. Dennis? Yes. Diana? Here. Patty? Here. Linda? Here. Here. Okay, the first item you have on our agenda is approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion to approve minutes, the regular board meeting, September 20th, 2017? Okay. Yes. I, I so move. Second. second. Okay, a second. I have, I have a question. Okay. In the uh, page seven, it talks about the other. It says Trusty Martin has a list of approval suggestions for hiring fees to be addressed on the next month's agenda for discussion. Is that it? Can you, can you point to the agenda? No, no, no. You said, she said you could talk about it in other. Yeah, we did talk about it. No, that's a, that's a separate statement. There's another statement that says, oh, talk about it now. So it says, oh, okay, here. Uh, yeah, here. But you didn't need to talk about it in the next agenda. You need to you talk about it at night and other. And, and, and I, I guess I, I wasn't, I didn't think it was finished. But we can recall it because I have an item to talk about today. Is that right, so only what he is something as well. So we can we can forget about it. I agree. Okay. No, so no no. Time. I was assuming that it was listed here. You know, it says well, you know, it can be addressed, put on the next month's agenda for discussion. We're going to discuss it further, but I don't care. Um, have we discussed it at, under other under the last under the last, last board meeting? We did we did have some discussion, mm -hmm. although I, I know that as we were leaving, Mr. Makula was approaching Mr. Kurtz about uh, well gee, can't we just come up with another, you know, a proposed uh, option for doing things and and uh, I think he was uh, politely dismissed. So uh, at that time I, I just figured when I saw this that Oh, we're going to put it on the agenda. Like I said, I have some comments to make, and I will make those comments today, and we can avoid discussing that. Okay. All right. Are there any other suggestions or yeah. questions for the minutes of September 20th? Under the um, Friends of Library, they just have a trustee. Uh, they don't have the TMR, which is a typo. Correct. Okay. Any other corrections? A few um, corrections. Um, they're mostly my comments. I just wanted them to be worded exactly as what I said, as opposed to it sounds like they're my. Um, I, I just wanted it worded more accurately to what I said. So that's just three items that list my comments. One would be the trustees levy. Where are you, Carolyn? Page. Um, under the um, director's report, page five, which doesn't pertain to my comments um, totally. It's regarding, um, well, actually it does. My comment, Trustee Derblick's request, um, I, whatever the sentence is, I want it deleted, and I just wanted my sentence put in there, which is what I specifically asked for. The sentence that's in there doesn't doesn't describe what I asked. So I've typed it up for um, Diane. Do you want me to read it to you as well? No, why don't you just give it to me? Oh, no, the, the, the rest of the yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. okay. I, I so, just want you to delete what you said I said, and then I just wanted to say Trustee Derblick requested, in addition to Susan Lemke's full report about well, the... Wait, let me just stop you for a second. What this says on the director's report is what Susan said. Now, Susan may or may not have quoted you correctly, but what Susan said is what should be under the director's report. So what Susan said is under the director's report is what should be there. Okay, so Susan is quoting what I requested. 
and what she's quoting is incorrect. Well, right, and it she, came from an email. All right, well, if she quoted you incorrectly, that's still what she said. That's still what okay, she said. Okay, but that's not what I yes. said. So if you're okay. not going to, well, you, you can't could, say I, I said mean, something correct. You could correctly. correct her at the meeting and say, Okay, I would like I this said. statement that I made, which was important, to make it in the minutes. I sent Susan an email and explained what information I had asked of Greg Fritz. And it was quoted incorrectly. It doesn't really make any sense. All right, well, we can put it in tonight's minutes that you said tonight that Susan incorrectly quoted you at the last meeting. Okay, and then Diane Winberg will add this to this night's minutes. This is so complicated. Well, you're telling us now something. Um, well, I didn't see the minutes. And why she would say I said something or I requested something I didn't, I don't know that until you put it in writing. So if you listen to the tape of what I said, anything I say is never quoted correctly. So I right, do you want to make to any you. corrections to what you said during the meeting on September 20th? Is there anything that is in the minutes? How do that I correct that this you think part? That you said. I do, I have two others. So how do I make this correction? I don't think you do correct it because it's correctly written. It's written what Susan said. Okay, then why don't you just eradicate it because I never requested that. Uh, all right, we, we can't How could you say I requested something if I didn't? What, which right, bullet point Susan, are you talking about? It's page it's five under eight. passport agency. Eight. The eight. biggest the biggest paragraph no, under okay. director's report. Okay. I know. It reflects what Susan said. Maybe Susan... I don't think Susan stated it. I think it well, was taken Susan. out of her director's report. Do you remember just saying that? Does that seem to be an accurate uh, assessment of what you said, Susan, or is it incorrect? Uh, honestly, I, I don't remember. I, I did say it in the director's report. I quoted from her email in the director's report. That's, I don't. that's where the error is. So what she typed in the director's report isn't what I typed in the email. So I just want to change the wording so it, it points out what I said. Can I? So is that a possible? No, because the minutes reflect what was said. She didn't Even say it. It was typed in the director's report. So it was incorrectly I typed. I'm asking that you correct what well, she put in the director's report. I can't correct her director's report. report. I, I, I quoted can't you. Correct her I know, but report. if you check the email, that's not what I said. Because I went back to my email, and that's why I right. retyped it for you. The minutes can reflect tonight that you have said tonight that you were incorrectly quoted Okay, and perfect. The so now I'll state report that. as of uh, last month. So you regarding, can state that right now. Regarding the um, passport agency, I requested, in addition to Susan Lemke's full report about the passport agency, please have Greg Pritz include a copy of the actual passport acceptance facility details and procedures. Um, I further stated um, that we. Sorry. Um, oh, then I put, I further stated that we start with the structured plan for the creation of a passport agency at the library. <coughs> so that was that. Okay. What if any other uh, places were you? Okay, and then you one that doesn't occurred. pertain to me is also under the passport agency. And Susan began explaining the passport agency, and then Greg Pitt Pritz. Um, stepped in with a couple of key points and I would like those added because if you recall at the last meeting you and um, trustee Ryan accused me of making false accusations about um, having full-time employees for the passport agency and right after both of you accused me of it he explained what a full-time when a full-time person may be hired so I just want to read what he said, and I'd like you to put this paragraph in there so we all won't get confused in the future about what the particulars are at this point for creating a passport agency. He was very descriptive, and I think it's important. And it wasn't included. All right, why don't you read it? We'll see if anyone else remembers it. Well, if you listen to the tape, I, you know, you'll remember it if that's a problem. I didn't make it up. We would cover these 55 hours with part-time employees. If we have 220 passport applications in one week, we would need to hire somebody or somebody's full-time. In a memorandum provided to the board, we estimated 1,000 passports the first year. These would be received in the first two to three months of the year based on the vacation of applicants. 
Now, the reason this is important is because it really, it clearly points out the things that could cause additional employees to be needed and, and what, what we're anticipating. And this is exactly what he said. If you don't believe me, you can listen to the, to the video, but I just think these are key points. Well, the, the problem, we do have a video, and that's great, and that maintains exactly what everyone says, but, but what the minutes are are supposed to be a summary. Okay, and, and this is a summary. It's every single everything. statement, and we certainly okay. don't quote statements verbatim in the minutes. This is but without the respect. A summary. And President we do Diamond, it, which is a good thing. President so, Diamond, you accused me I, of making, you and, and Linda Ryan accused me of putting false accusations on the table when I said, well, you're planning on hiring full-time, and the two of you said, I made that up. And Greg Pritz clearly defined why we would need full-time employees, and you still won't put it in the minutes. Uh, I don't think we accused you of anything. You did, did, that say, was your exact word. We did say it would be, we would not have to hire anyone. At you know, right you, you really have to try to remember okay, from month to month. Is there anything else that you want? So to you say? are not going to add these three specific well, points? I, I only heard two so far, I think. Was there a third one? I don't know. Maybe well, it was that we would have 55 hours, which is already added. The okay. second statement was if we have 220 passport applications in one week, we would need to hire somebody or somebody's full time. Okay, that's. And then he also mentioned the memorandum that the administration had given to the board in which they estimated 1,000 passports the first year. He further explained so, that they right, would so receive we have, them. We have a motion on the table and a second. And I have to ask the movement in the second whether or not they want to accept any changes. It's really up to them because they've made the motion and the second. So I'm asking the movement and the seconder if they have any, if they want to accept any changes to their motion to approve the minutes other than the typo, uh, which I think... I'm not good. finished with the mistakes in my other two that relate to me. Well, let's ask about the one so far. Okay. Movement, second, do either of you okay. want to make any changes? I would like to make a statement. Okay. My understanding of making corrections to the minutes and what the minutes are the minutes, if there's a misspelling, if there's an absolutely yes, okay, this is not worded correctly, and that's fixed, that should be done. Other than that, I understand that the minutes are supposed to be a summary. And having exact quotes is not, in my opinion, a summary. Are you relating to the details? I'm of relating to whether I want to change anything, and I explain my views on what I feel the minutes are. All right, so I, I take it the movement does not want to no. change the motion. And unless I hear anything else from the table in terms of the minutes. Okay, there are two that you did not quote what I said. One was regarding communications, and the most important one were my comments for the levy. Now, I noticed you quoted everyone verbatim for their comments under the levy, but you didn't do that for mine, so I would like to ask you to do the same. I, I don't think everyone was quoted verbatim. Well, there's quotes. Yeah. That would mean that's exactly what they said. Occasionally there's a quote, but uh, not well, if you look at them, there's So where are you like referencing again? Everyone's seven. comments regarding the seven. passport agency. Seven. 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 Well, if, if we did put this in the minutes, verbatim, we would have to reflect that I asked you about six times whether or not you wanted to raise the levy, keep it the same, or do something else, and every time you refused to answer. But so the three we points, put the points in verbatim, we'd have to put all that you in. You could too. do that as well, but you didn't put in my three points and what I said about needing data in order to make a valid decision on the levy. You so that would be response to you. But it does say library needs to evaluate staffing, and so that is data. Costs need to be reviewed and reevaluated. That is, she cannot make a decision on a levy, but she cannot confirm what money is being spent on. It all is there. That's not Plus what the I data said. to make a valid decision. It's right there. But what you failed to put in there was that I mentioned the general fund projected revenues and spending. That was my first sentence. Indicates we would look fine until 21 22. Uh, they, you know what? Not every single one of my sentences is obviously in there. Either. That's no, all you said. Either. You didn't I mean, say much. Come on. No, I but these are points. I've got the movement. Just the movement or the secondary? 
Want no. to accept any it's additional no. challenges? No. All right, the movement and the second um, amendment. Not accept any additional challenges. Question, does, the, does the lawyer have any input or does he have any involvement in that matter or is he here? Um, we normally ask our attorney to be here when we have a number of matters on the agenda that are sort of unusual or different. Uh -huh. Minutes are something that we talk about every time, sure. so we don't really ask. Uh, I know you don't normally ask to put on that. But we can ask, ask uh, What would you like? What's the question? Well, what I'm well, asking is, is Carol has raised a number of issues here, and I'm wondering from your perspective uh, how we should proceed, you know, from a yeah, Correct. Um, okay. Well, obviously, I wasn't here last last month, so yeah, I don't so, know. Yeah. I can tell you this: minutes. The president's right. Minutes are supposed to be a fair summary of what occurred at the meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not a verbatim account. And it would be an extremely unusual for work. Correct. Um, it sounds like the minutes accurately reflect what happened. And one of the trustees disagrees with that um, account of what happened. And so, again, the president's right. Her comments about these minutes should be reflected in this month's meeting. But, but they're, they're, they're not stating some of the key items that she felt were key items. So I guess there's a difference of opinion. The person that generated the, the, the minutes and the person that... And, and so what you do is you have a vote by the board, and the board as a whole is going to make a decision as to whether or not, in the board's opinion, these are a fair reflection of the discussion that occurred at okay. the last meeting. So we can have a vote. You are going to have a vote. Yeah, it's already There's a motion right now pending to approve these minutes. Okay. There's been a second for that. There's not going to be any changes to these minutes yeah. right now because the movement has, uh, is not in favor of that. And so the president will call the roll call as to whether or not these minutes will be approved as it's okay. If thanks that motion for, fails, yeah. then it'll have to be addressed again. Okay. So thanks for pointing that out. Yep. I just wanted to make sure. So. Okay. Uh, hi, roll call, Diane. Uh, Karen? Yes. Carolyn? What are we voting on? The minutes. On the minutes. As, as written. As, as written. With the exception of that typo, which was no. not accepted change. Okay. Dennis? No. Diane? Yes. Patty? Yes! Linda? Wow, I'll Well, good, I'm glad. <laughs> yes. Tim? Yes. Yeah. Okay, all right, fine. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the public comments section of our agenda. Has anyone registered for public comment? Check it over there. Yeah, all right. All right. All right. She wanted to speak. Oh, okay. All right. Well, um, all right. I'll start with this one. Um, Mr. Marcula? Yes. Mr. Marcula? Oh, there you are. How are you? Okay. Okay, Mr. Marcula, you, you know we have a time limit. Right. Okay. Um, what I want to say is, 25 years ago, with the same number of items loaned out here approximately, there were 60 employees. Right now, there's 117. Uh, I don't know what happened. I guess we're running the circus or whatever. Uh, there's about uh, let's see. There's about the same number of people serving on the floor. Uh, serving the patrons who mostly serve themselves. And now we have self-checkout. We have computerized uh, hard catalog. Uh, with all this efficiency, we're actually being less efficient in, in the, how much it costs us to, to lend out books and, and, and tapes or discs. Um, we need to spend some time to find out how, how we can cut this uh, increase out of the budget. This, it's only $145,000 out of a $7 million budget. Uh, it's not on the agenda today, but maybe we can have a special meeting just for the purpose of figuring out where we can make some cuts in, in personnel. Uh, I see it, it says up here, it's not the 1960s anymore. It's not 1960 anymore. But we had a library in 1960. I wasn't here in 1960, but in 1970. 
uh, where we loaned out books. We didn't loan out uh, uh, DVDs or whatever it did. But we didn't, we didn't, all these activities we have, we never went out and asked the taxpayers, do they want to spend two or three million dollars a, a year on running all these activities? We just took it upon ourselves here in this um, board to add all these things on and not asking the taxpayer. They expect the library to be books and, and DVD rentals and maybe come here to use a computer or something, which is really most people have one. So I think maybe it might be a good idea maybe to put a, a referendum on the spring ballot on the primary and ask the people if they want to spend an extra $2 million a year on, on the library budget for uh, extracurricular activities beyond what we're doing right now, in books and tapes and discs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McClellan. Okay, and one other request for uh, public participation. Uh, Des Martin. You can stay where you are. You can still no, I'll stand up. Okay. I wrote my down because I'm not the best speaker. So, and in the interest of time, it goes faster. So, uh, so my concern, uh, again, my name is Dennis Martin. I'm 8706. I'm uh, North Osceola. So my concern is regarding a recent request proposed to the library board to raise the tax levy. I was surprised at our last board meeting that raising the tax levy was the only proposal put forward to the board to consider. There was no option put forward to consider cutting programs or people. I and millions of others make cuts both in our personal lives and the business world when, when unexpected situations occur that require tightening the belt. The library leadership did not bring up the risk of tax levy increase to ensure the budget could stay flat and would not need additional funding. Proper risk analysis should always be completed and provided when the budget is proposed. Instead, we received nothing from the library leadership that has been in place for quite some time. To address this issue, I made a request to add an agenda item to the library board meeting this last week and was denied. Now, I'm new, and I understand I'm going to make mistakes. I realize I made a mistake in how I made the request. My request was I would like to request an agenda item uh, be added to our October 18th board meeting. My request is having Susan Lundy and Greg Pritz, uh, what specific cuts could be made to prevent the need for a levy increase of any percentage in 2018? I was politely told after my first request, board meetings are the place for trustees to raise questions and make requests of the library director and the staff. Individual trustees should never make such requests or demands on their own. So realizing my mistake, and it was a mistake, I understand it, I then followed up and sent another request asking, I would then like to make a request that the agenda, agenda item be added to the October board meeting to discuss having the library research what cuts, uh, what cuts could be made to avoid a tax levy increase. But I don't see it on the agenda. It's unfortunate that we could not work together to get some of my requests on the agenda. I and Carol, Do I and Carol Durbley are absolutely opposed to raising the tax levy, and I'm very disappointed the library leadership has not taken the appropriate steps to explore other options to increase the tax levy. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't have any other requests for public comment here. I, didn't the uh, young lady want to talk? I, I signed the wrong list. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, that's the wrong list. I, know. Oh, I apologize. We're okay. on the wrong list. Sorry okay. about that. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Kathy and Nichols. Yeah, I, I was here last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were, right. I'm sorry. Did I, you're yeah. sort of sitting there. Yeah, you did. Come on over here. You can, uh, uh, I just, you know, I have five seconds to say. I love the library. I've used it for. Uh, as long as I've lived here, you know, which is, I've lived here in 1970, I support, I think the people who run the library know what they're doing, and I think if they need more money, they should get it, and I'm fine with, with paying more taxes and getting the services that this library has. I use the books, I use the movies, I use the programs, and if that's what it takes, that's, if that's the step that needs to take, um, I'm very willing to pay. So I wouldn't consider Mr. McCool speaking for the voters, because I'm one too, and I, I'm opposite. I, I don't want, I, I want them to have the money that they need, I want them to have the staff they need. I know when, 
when I was when I started teaching in 1965, I had 48 kids in my class and one teacher. I mean, there it's way different now. There's way different needs. I don't know what the different needs are in the library, but they do, and they're gonna they're going to uh, to run it the way and to the best of their ability, and they need our support and our money. If you want to know what the voters are, right. uh, yeah, we're, we don't have debates here. Um, but we do have one other request for public comment, uh, Mr. Edward Nichols. Yes. Um, I'm actually Kathy's son. I'm basically a lifetime resident of uh, Niles. And uh, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of my wife. Also, we live in the Renaissance condominiums. We're both patrons of the library. Uh, and we think that um, it is an incredible resource to have. And speaking towards the increase in tax, I am all for it. I think. A lot of times, if you look in comment sections and other things, um, people tend to, it's easier to complain about things and not as often people come out and lend their support. So I wanted to come here tonight to lend my support and say that I would be for an increase um, to give the library the resources to continue doing the work that they're doing. Um, and libraries, I think, are in a position of kind of evolving as this digital age comes on and, and finding their place. And I think that there are many more things that they can do besides just checking out books and checking out DVDs. And I like the direction that I've seen so far that the Niles Library is taking. And um, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. I don't think I've missed anyone else who asked to speak during public comment. So we will move on to the next agenda, which is the Treasurer's Report. Jim? Uh, yes, I can. So uh, you all should have a copy of the Treasurer's Report. Uh, starting on, first of all, it's, uh, it's September's the third month of the fiscal year. We're so we're a quarter of the way through the year's budget, or 25%. That's kind of the benchmark we look at. Uh, if I'm correct, in November, right, we're going to get the uh, presentation of the auditor as yeah, part of previous yes. years. Yes. Yeah. Year. So something to look forward in November. It's always a fun time. Uh, a couple of the uh, highlights that I just wanted to point out on page nine: our revenues. So our revenues are under budget. Just you know, it's something that we need to take a look at. We received all our payments uh, for August. Uh, we're looking for our February payment. Uh, in relation to revenues being under budget, you know, property taxes can be uh, affected by issues outside of our control, including the refunds and the uh, tip districts and whatnot. Uh, also, as of this writing, uh, the county uh, has sent us a uh, um, report for refunds and adjustments totaling 32000 Nine fourteen sixty cents. These uh, these refunds are uh, generally, uh, and Greg, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, as um, property holders uh, request uh, audits of their uh, uh, their their property, the uh, their taxes can go down. So the county will then ask for a refund of that money back from us that uh, is owed to them. So you know that's one thing that can affect our our revenue. And the replacement tax, it was a rough estimate of 145000 Looks like it will be only about 113 for this year. All right. Salaries are under budget at this point of 88000 which is going great. We turn to page 10. Library materials, uh, downloadables are under over budget, but they should even out by the end of the year. Am I correct on that? Yes, sir. Yes, they are. All right. Materials are over budget, uh, primarily due to the yearly payments for the online databases. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not sure about that. Library operating expenses, the adult and the uh, juvenile juvenile categories are slightly over budget, but overall the entire category is under budget. So we're doing good on that. Page 11. Uh, general and administrative. Overall categories under budget. Uh, and we're doing good on that. Page 12, all items are running under budget. All, page 13, same thing. Uh, that's, if anybody has any specific questions, let me know about uh, any line items. Uh, we can address it. What's your overall summary? Overall summary is that we are currently running under budget on our, uh, on our uh, income statement. Okay. Yes. Uh, on 
on uh, page 11. Sure. Under bank fees, I see it says 109%. Um, is that, were, did, were fees increased or what? Do you have any idea what that, why it's a little higher? Well, we actually uh, uh, received the refund of uh, bank fees, and if you look closely, that 109 percent is in brackets, which uh, which indicates it's uh, for it's, our favor. Yeah, it's in our it's, oh, a, it's in okay. our favor. So it's uh, a good thing. yeah, so they had us on the wrong schedule, and we talked about it, and they took a look at um, at the last uh, few years, and we funded uh, about I want to say 3,300 uh, or something in that neighborhood. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Um, so, question. Yes. yes sure. Anything that's in brackets would, uh, would mean a similar thing, that it's in our favor? Because um, like on page 13, there's a 434 in brackets. The bottom line, under net uh, surplus. Yeah, I wish I could say it was that easy. But it isn't. Uh, no. See, I look for the easy way. Yeah, the brackets, <coughs> brackets are um, contextual. Okay. So in this case, um, the very bottom, mm -hmm. where it says net surplus slash deficit, the uh, surplus is a good thing, but doesn't have brackets, and the deficit is generally a bad thing, which means that expenses okay. exceed uh, revenues. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. Um, I have just one comment on your report where you say we're getting the next payments in February. We might not be getting them that soon. I was listening to the county board meeting, uh, finance committee meeting, and the assessor Joe Berrio said that uh, due to the county budget, he expects to be laying off people in the assessor's office and that the bills will be going out late, which means the people are paying it late, which means that we will get the income later than we might otherwise do in this report. Did they mention any? Specific no, yeah, did not. It did not. Hmm. So, any other uh, comments or questions on the treasurer's report? Well, I do have one. I do need to discuss unless you get. I had a specific. question. It's about the health reimbursement account. It's not specific to the numbers here. What I page just, are you on, Carol? Um, it's page twelve, and um, I'm looking at our actual and our budget. And we're under budget, but I recall last month, I believe, we were over, and it's because people just submit, and I believe the HRA is the account where people submit their medical expenses and we reimburse them. That's what this is? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, and, I, and it was over, I think, was it September, and it was just because a lot of people submitted their receipts. But then I noticed it was also high in June. So my question is, does our HRA reimbursements work on like a calendar year or do you get two months after the fiscal year ends to submit them? That that may be a reason why there are peaks and valleys. It's okay, so it's actually a um, uh, uh, fiscal year uh, is the, uh, is the uh, year, you know, consistent with our, mm -hmm. with our fiscal year um, for that. I'm looking at the numbers. And year to date, uh, we're under budget by thirteen hundred dollars. Um, but you know, irrespective of uh, the active information, just like um, other Section One Twenty Five type plans, you have you have like seventy five days subsequent to the end of the year uh, to make filings for the previous year. Okay, okay that so that question. so that works. Um, what what we don't do here is differentiate between plan years. But just take you know account for the money as we reimburse it. Oh. So it's treated like on a cash basis. But even if it was you know uh, based on plan year, at the end of any fiscal year, we would not have the facility to estimate and therefore record an accrual to account for incurred but not uh, reimbursed uh, expenses. Because in order to do that. We would have to ask each individual uh, what expenses they have in order to do that. Okay. Okay. We, I mean, you know, we could we can go back now and do it, but that would be like a, a, a change in the way that we're doing our accounting at this point. Oh no, that's fine. I was just wondering if we already had a plan in place where our fiscal mm -hmm. year ended in 
and June, June 30th, mm -hmm. but you have until August mm -hmm. to submit your bills. Yeah, generally 75 days late. Is it? Okay, all right. And then that was me. Nine fifteen. Okay, thank you. That's what I was going to uh, Tim, I think you were not quite finished. Uh, yeah, we do have to discuss the IMRF FICA uh, deduction. When the uh, IMRF was first set up, uh, we all know that it was a, a, a one-time thing, and uh, there were a number of uh, uh, factors to set up. Uh, unfortunately, the deduction for the IMRF was done before FICA tax was applied rather than after, as it should have been. So that did result in uh, um, an $22,000 uh, overall uh, error split half by the library and half by the staff. So the library um, ding is $11,000. About 8500 of that was for last year. So that's going to be reflected in our um, final figures uh, in la for last year, as we will see in November. For this year, it's about $2,500 to $3,000. Uh, and that will be reflected on our Social Security FICA line item. So it's really not a, um, it's not going to hit our payroll uh, budget. The staff uh, will have to make up the uh, other $11,379 since it was uh, their deduction on their paychecks. They will have an opportunity to do this through a one-time payment or 12 uh, spaced out over 12 payments uh, or a lump sum de deduction in January. But the, the library finance department will help them take care of it. So I do want to say, uh, you know, even though an error was made, we should uh, realize that our, uh, and this is one thing that I, that I am, um, I guess, proud of, would be one way to say it. Our accounting and our uh, auditing processes are in place such that uh, it did catch this and caught it, it you know, in, in time that it wasn't you know, an overly dramatic uh, uh, hit. So I am happy about that. I have a quick question. Absolutely. So, so how, how is it determined that it be a 50 50 split, so to speak? Uh, did the employees get a chance to say that, uh, you know, hey, you guys made a mistake, you guys should cover it all, or did the library? No. I don't know how that works. That's fine. Yeah. So, um, when you're when you're paid wages, which are uh, FICA taxable, yeah. um, we withhold 7.65% okay. from the employee's uh, paycheck, and then we match it dollar for dollar. Okay. That's why it's okay. good. That's yeah. why it's good. Okay. Yeah. I do want to say one thing, though. Sure. Um, it's not a ding. It's not a ding. As, as I much as it's it is not a ding. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, positive. it's, not, it's <laughs> not an extra expense. We owe this money yes. by law, right. yeah. um, and we caught it. Yeah. And uh, so now we have a mechanism, mechanism in place. We have been in touch with our payroll lender, and they are working on remediation and, and uh, filing the corrected quarterly and annual filings so that we're squared with Uncle Sam. Right. So we're set to go forward through the correct time. All right. Any uh, other questions on that item? Thank you, buddy. Is that it then? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is, oh wait, what do we have? Uh, let's see, let's go. Let's see oh, okay, um, so uh, I now have to entertain a motion to approve the payment of bills for operating expenses of $198,232.20, payroll expenses of $281,165.13, and special reserve expenses of zero for a total monthly expense of four hundred seventy-nine thousand three hundred ninety-seven dollars and thirty-three cents. Do I have a motion? I make a motion. Second. Uh, okay. Any discussion uh, regarding the bills? And then maybe roll call. Karen. Yes. Carolyn. No. Dennis. Uh, no. Diane. Yes. Patty. Yes. Linda? Yes. Yes. Okay, that passes and we'll go to the next item, which is the director's report. Susan, would you like to go through the report? Um, I 
I'm assuming everybody here has read it already, or they will read it in detail when they get a chance. I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, I did have, ask Greg to write a couple pieces for this this time, and um, I don't think we want to get into detail on the topic of TIFFs at this meeting, because we already have a great deal to discuss on this meeting, but I would encourage you to read on page 27 when you get a chance this in some detail, because um, the fact that the village is trying to start up four new TIFFs in addition to the two TIFFs they already have is really going to be a hit for us. And I think the board is going to have to seriously consider what their response to that is going to be. But like I said, I don't think we should get into the, into the weeds on that at this time. Um, and then he also wrote another piece at the end here, um, page 36, um, talking about Mr. Lukula's suggestion of cutting the library staff by 10%. And I would encourage you to take a look at this. It does reflect that um, overall our payroll has gone down. Since You're on what page? I'm sorry. 36. And that we um, have tried hard to take full time positions and as they become open, change them into part time positions. We've done a great deal to try to reduce the cost of our staff, and it is down from what it was. Um, so I just want to make it clear that even though we keep talking about it as if our staff had ballooned. Um, it has not ballooned. And when Mr. Makula says we have 117 staff, he's including our subs who are not actually on the table. They get paid so how many come to a shift. I think six or seven. Six they or they seven. only so work. So 110 instead of 110. So I would have to count them exactly. Oh, well, that's roughly estimated. Roughly 10. Yep. Yeah, so I just wanted to call attention to that. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is, and I'm not going to belabor this, but I have to make it clear that a letter to the editor that was published in the journal this last week um, reads, the Niles Main Library Board majority plans to vote on a 2.1% levy increase at the October 18th board meeting. After nearly a $1 million increase for the 2017-18 budget, the greedy library wants more of your tax dollars. Our very own chicken little business manager, Greg Fritz, convinced the board majority that the sky is falling. And I just want to say, I object in the strongest possible terms to a trustee resorting to that kind of childish name calling of a member of the library staff who only made the reports that he was asked to make is completely inappropriate. And that is all I have. And, and I, would, I would like to chime in on that too. I don't think any of the board members should be insulting or calling any of our staff members' names, especially uh, in a newspaper publication that truly is, is unprofessional and is unfair, truly unfair. And I really think at the last meeting, um, Greg Fritz in particular was asked to give us a financial product prediction. He did that. Um, we were the ones who chose to raise the levy. Not was, everybody. You're correct, but we as a board chose to raise the levy. Uh, it was not Mr. Fritz or not any staff members. Uh, and I, I think it really is inappropriate for our board members to refer to staff members in any such way. So I would, I would agree with those comments. And, and I have a comment too. Uh, so uh, I agree that it's, it's not right to, to be called. I think, I think it's coming out of frustration uh, out of what's been occurring uh, you know, over years time. And I think that person is, is just is at her wit's end on what to do to try to keep costs down. Uh, she makes numerous attempts to get an understanding of the list of programs, not the, the, the tapes, the books, the CDs, and so on that are, are, are put out there, but numerous attempts to understand what the programs are, what's the staff behind it, and what's the cost of the staff behind those programs, and she can't get it. And I'm told in an email that it would take a, a tremendous amount of time to come up with that information. When uh, in the business world, when we have programs, we do a business case, we do a cost justification, we understand everything that's involved in doing that project, and we surely have cost of the people behind those projects, and if we needed to make a cut, and cuts are made all the time in the business world where they ask for money back, projects are canceled all the time in the business world, and they say, give me the money back, even though the budget's already been made. So I'm telling you, in the real world, where they don't have the taxpayer credit card available to them, 
uh, you know, costume ethic. And I think that's the reason for her frustration. Uh, I, I, I know she's talked about this with me, and she said, you know, I'm going to try to limit that in the future, uh, but it's, it's terribly out of frustration. Thank you. But I would like to say, I'm next. Oh, are you? I didn't know. I am representing the record. Go right ahead. First of all, I do not reflect anything that was in that paper. I just want to say that because I only speak for myself and not speaking for anybody else on this board. Um, first of all, it's just really upsetting. Um, I didn't read that, unfortunately. Um, it was a board's decision. Whether you vote for it, yes, or vote for no, the board stands behind the board's decision. That is what we do. Um, and also, I just want to bring up this that is kind of piggyback with a FOIA request with the, the uh, comments that you just stated that she wants uh, information regarding um, hours. And they, we set a budget. The staff then goes within that budget. We do not micromanage. And that is the way it should be. And they don't go over budget. And if you want to micromanage and micromanage and micromanage, that is just not OK. And then you FOIA it. And then what happens? Huh, now we pay lawyer fees. That is unnecessary. That's all I have to say. Thank you. May I make a comment now? Well, uh, you may make a comment, but Thank I won't you. tolerate any further Thank insults you. Okay. of our and, staff. And, and refer to my, in reference to my um, letter to the editor, where I mentioned Chicken Little, for all of you who may not know the story, we Chicken Little was story. someone. Aware of the story. Chicken yeah. Little yeah. was someone who repeatedly. You know, we are aware of the story, Carolyn. Just go okay. On. So okay. the point of this this article is that we've had presentations which I which I know the board has given Greg Pritz direction, and he has presented us with presentations indicating we need to raise the levy. I'm saying based on the fact that we don't reevaluate our spending, our programs, our personnel, there isn't this dire need to increase the levy. Um, that was the point of all, all the right, details I after okay. that comment. And now I think I'm Thank you. Okay. I was going to try and not say anything, but I'm sorry. I'm going to say something. Um, last meeting, I mentioned how I was offended by the insults and by the calling us all idiots. Again, we hear this. We hear this in the newspaper. Excuse article. me, I never called anyone an idiot. Well, saying we don't know what Chicken Little is is kind of like saying we're idiots. A young, young child knows who Chicken Little is and knows the story. So I'm sorry. I do take offense to this. Thank you. I'm done. All right, um, just re returning to the report that you were just discussing, um, I do think this is uh, interesting in terms of the number of hours paid, dropping, you know, I'm on page 36, dropping from about 147,000 to 140,000. That's going from 2011 to 2016, 17. And also, while the number of part-time hours paid has remained about the same, the number of full-time hours has dropped from 92,000 to 85,000. And Greg, would it be correct that generally full-time hours are paid at a higher rate than <coughs> part-time hours? Uh, generally speaking, uh, there are some uh, more roles in the library. All right. OK. Can I ask Thank a question you. about page 36? What is your question? Um, based on the charts and this detail, what would you say our savings was? <coughs> Uh, in the year that we uh, actually did the uh, uh, retirement incentive plan uh, between salaries and benefits of the people that decided to uh, take the plan, net of the uh, costs um, was about $438,000, I remember. What year was that? Um, that was um, 13, four, uh, I'm sorry, 14, 15. So we had a savings of four hundred thousand dollars in 2014-15. Well, that's what those hours were valued at. Um, and then there was salaries dropped to four hundred thousand dollars. Is that what we're saying? Uh, I'd have to look at it, but you know, because we have to understand. Excuse me. 
um, you have to understand that uh, uh, remaining salaries were raised that year 3%, as was approved by the board. So there's some netting in that in that case, and, and in some cases the mix of employees has changed. Moreover, um, we dropped more than 10,000 hours representing the five people who left. We dropped uh, you know something in the neighborhood of 16,000 hours. The 6,000 additional hours related to a uh, hiring freeze that the board had put in place at that time, pending the receipt of uh, the matrix study. So once the matrix study had been received and we started to act on the uh, recommendations of that study, um, this, the additional 6,000 hours increased and actually went a little bit beyond that. I guess, you know, visually what, what you can do is, is look at this curve and take and take the high point and just extend a, a line that's parallel to the axes and your savings would be represented by, by the area less than. Okay, I don't have I don't have a dollar dimension on that. But you know, over time what has happened in terms of the actual cost is that our salaries tend to go up three percent a year. Yes. And when it goes up three percent a year, it you know, it it's it obfuscates the savings in the number of hours. You mean it cuts? Excuse me? You mean it cuts the I was just trying to simplify the word obfuscate? Obfuscate. Yes. Obfuscate. Yeah. So what's it mean? It hides it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And and you can't and you can't actually tell. But if you look at the number of hours that we're actually paid, those hours have decreased. But what but it's the excuse same me, okay. what this does not include what this does not include is that there are a number of people who are salaried here at the library who tend to work more than thirty seven and a half hours a week. So if some the labor department might disagree with you. And if you if you tend to uh, account for those numbers, the hours would look far differently. But you're you know you have to focus on the paid hours. Yeah, and and, and it tends to go up. So even though you're working less hours, so you're you're kind of diverging. You know, so your your hours may have gone down, but your your pay is going up. The units are so the units. so. This is a great you know show of hours are going down that you're moving a little bit more. Uh, efficiently, but it doesn't reflect anything in the way of, you know, salaries. You know, the total outcome. Yeah, there's no dollar sign. There's no dollar sign whatsoever. So it's a nice, nice, nice chart. And then I just wanted to just throw one other thing out there. In terms of, in terms of our, the purpose of this is obviously to um, recognize a decrease in salaries or an increase in salaries so you're bringing this to our attention but in turn and when we talk about staffing and, and needing to take a, a, a very close look at our positions and our outcomes don't you don't you believe that's another aspect of how staffing should be addressed in terms of mr. McCullough mentioned a 10% cut but I think we should at least take the time to reevaluate positions and their outcomes and how they um, move this library in whatever direction we're going. Wouldn't that be another way to look at this? But, you know, we did do that yeah, when we did the matrix. Oh, no, that's the same. We, we the did matrix that. is we two did. years old, and I'm well, talking you know, about... I'm not going to pay 40000 every two see, years. See, I think you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. Well, I, I think we had an outside agency come in, okay. look that's at our not staffing, what I, that's not what I'm asking and you to do. what they said here is the library's current salaries lag the market slightly. Most positions, um, when the midpoint salaries to balance, their counterparts are compared. Um, that that was one of their findings, okay, and that's not so what we I'm did saying. look at this. We I'm spent not saying, money on this. I'm We're not, not going to keep revisiting. I'm it. not asking what is our salary in relation to the market. I'm asking what are our staffing positions, what are the outcomes of these positions in relation to what this library produces. That's a whole different explanation of the activity here. They did the same thing. They didn't no, they, study they've never also. done it. No, they've never done it. Well, and we haven't agree. done it. But anyway, that's that was just my point. And then to mention okay. the $400,000 drop 
in 2014-15. Wait, what, what are you talking about? When Greg mentioned there's approximately a $400,000 drop in 2014-15 regarding some changes with salaries. But we also need to remember that we were, we just recently approved IMRF, which brought salaries and benefits up to $2.5 So we are still at a very high level of cost. IMRF was a one-time expense. No, IMRF will always be here, and the price tag doesn't down. go down. Can I All right, let's uh, go ahead. Um, I understand what you're saying about IMRF. However, what was said multiple times this meeting is that we are practicing hiring part-timers who do not get IMRF. But they do. They do? Yes. Not if they're under 20 no, hours, right? No, 1,000 hours. Right. 20 hours. Right. 20 hours. Right. 20 That's a whole different thing. Thing. Okay, Thanks let's move on to communications. Thank you. Um, I oh. think we have those in our book. Anything else? I just wanted to pass out these cute little things that do not reproduce well. That um, We have a Muslim homeschooling group that has been using the library, and they wrote a whole bunch of these notes on this video. Mm -hmm. A couple of them because I thought they were Can you pass those around? Yes. Thank you. And that's all I have for that. All right. Patron suggestions. Those are also in the book. Is that correct? Yep. Anything else on those? No. All right. Well, How about, can you say something on the patron suggestions? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I've noticed that month after month when we review patron suggestions that more often than not, our patrons who are our residents are asking for more movies. They're asking for more activities. They're asking for more presence of the library staff. They're asking for more uh, programs. I rarely see anybody uh, asking for a cut in materials and or services and or staff. So, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, Go ahead. Thank you. I yeah, appreciate it. So, uh, okay, I'm still talking to us. All right, thanks. Appreciate Go ahead. it. Yeah. So, uh, to uh, anybody to characterize the residents as looking for the library to only be point putting out books and DVDs uh, belays what the residents are actually looking for. So, uh, I think as we move forward, we do have to recognize that many, many residents do not come to our meetings and do not express their opinions, but they do express them through our, through our suggestions. And our job is to represent these people as well as uh, other people who are expressing uh, desire and intelligence. So we do have to balance those those desires. We're, we're right. representing you know, the residents. You. And, 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 and as I, I right. apologize yeah. for interrupting, it's okay. I just wanted to apologize. Okay, fine. Let's move on to the next agenda. Uh, Friends of the Library, I understand that meeting was canceled. Um, do we have any other information about the Friends of the Library uh, to report? Okay. All right. Uh, legislative, anything, Susan? No. Or Rails? No. Okay, fine. Then we're moving on to new business. All right, so um, I understand we have a presentation regarding the uh, purpose of the library, um, a PowerPoint that is ready to be shown. Where are we at on the... This is under 9A. Under 9A. Oh, did we skip over the Friends of the Library? I they just said they're just saying it. Oh, I'm sorry. I was reading the, the nice thing printed out uh, the lighters, but I, I do have something to say about the Friends of the Library. Um, what is because I was uh, tasked <coughs> with reaching out to my, my, my good friend, uh, uh, Mr. Hanusic. Hopefully I'm not butchering his name. So, uh, and uh, he was uh, he was concerned about coming to uh, to the library because he was concerned about uh, monies being kept uh, from the friends of the library. And uh, I have an article that, that uh, our brilliant uh, newspaper writer Igor had. Uh, from December 23rd, where he talks about how the library intends to keep that money. Uh, and I asked, I thought last meeting or the meeting before, uh, you know, is the library keeping the money? And they said, uh, no, we're not keeping the money. But 
it's my understanding that the money is being kept, and it's being kept under like a miscellaneous. <coughs> so did they get their twenty-three thousand dollars back? Well, it's their twenty-three thousand dollars. It's the friends of the library's money. No, no, they are. They are five hundred one seats. This item has been discussed. We've nope. discussed this nope. round and round, and it does yeah. not belong to Mr. Benuziak or the friends of the library. And we always have said that this is money that belongs to the library. And we've said that, we've had this discussion about yeah, every meeting. So, so, so if, it, if, if it's, are you charging sales tax on, uh, on the stuff that you're selling? We, we um, learned yeah. that the friends failed to pay sales tax. That they well, they're a 501c corporation. They still should have been paying sales tax on it, and apparently right. for a long time. Why, why would that why? be? Even a 501c can't be required to pay sales tax if they're not. Can be. Yes. Can okay. I just say this is on the agenda for what later, so we'll be getting into this sales taxation. So, so I, I'm just trying to figure out why I was okay. told no, we're not keeping money. And, I don't think and he us. I understood that because we're all very clear. Yeah, we've always been clear that. Well, he asked. You know, he asked at the last meeting. I think there's confusion between the money in Friends' account and the money that we didn't transfer into the Friends' account. I think somehow his yes got confused in his mind, but there are two separate amounts of money, and you're right. One, the library withheld and, and did not deposit, and the friends have their account where their money isn't, but where there's other money. Okay. All right, right. So that's yeah. the clarification. All right, uh, Susan is right. This is on the agenda. It's number H, so we can talk about that uh, in yeah. order, I suppose. So let's go back to where we were, to the beginning of the PowerPoint here. Okay, um, last month um, the topic of what, what the purpose of the public library had come up, um, Mr. Martin had said that this is something that the board should talk about. I actually agree and I think the board should talk about it before they set the levy. I think it would be a good idea for you guys to come to some consensus about why we have the library. So I have prepared a short presentation. I am going to ask you to hold your comments for the end of it. All right. So from the very beginning of public libraries, their purpose has been for members of the community to pool their resources and share their collections. So the very first American Lending Library was begun in 1731 by Benjamin Franklin. They had the motto, to support the common good is divine. So the idea of it is you pool your resources and it is for the common good. So the way it worked is that they paid 50 shillings a piece and then they agreed to pay another 10 shillings a year and that way they would have a much better library that they all could share than each of them could afford to have on their own. Where we are now in 2017 is the result of the work of dedicated and thoughtful board members over a 60 year time period. In 1964, they had a collection of books but they had no library building. So they went to the voters and they requested approval of a bond issue and a tax rate. And as you can imagine, that passed. This is the program from the grand opening celebration at the beginning of the new library. Uh, they have a, had a capacity of 100,000 books at that time. And the new library, which you can see there, and if you'll take a look at the screen, you'll see that the um, that, that is still part of the library today. It's just that it was altered in the 1990s. Um, they, um, the, it's 25,220 square feet. And this is what the interior looked like. You can see that it was basically all one big room. It had a mezzanine here, and the stacks were under the mezzanine and over it. So it was one big stack, and the uh, director was quoted in the newspaper as saying that there was one control desk, and that person could see the entire library from that desk. In the early 1980s, they added a wing here with the children's department and a circulation area. Um, so now they had three desks to staff. They had that reference desk in the big room, they had a children's desk to staff, and they had a circulation desk. And now they have 38,000 square feet. In 1997, they, worked on, they began work on a large addition, a very significant addition. Probably a lot of you remember that time. And so you can see here that that's the original building over here, and this is what they added. So you can see that they added a great deal to the library. And uh, even with the old building, you can see that they split that one big room. They added a floor in so that we had two more floors. 
Um, they brought the total square footage up to 65,000 square feet, and now we had four floors that needed to be supervised. And this is why the number of staff continued to creep up, and the people that keep saying we only had 60 people in the 1990s, we doubled the size of the library in the 1990s, and we made it a four-floor facility. It was a huge change. In 2012, the board unanimously voted to do an almost complete interior renovation of the library up with the times. They added teen underground, middle ground, a training lab, study <coughs> rooms, additional meeting rooms, and a digital media lab. All of these boards who approved these different renovations were just trying to predict the needs of future residents and make sure that the library kept up with the changes in society. You may wonder why they went ahead and increased the size of the library, increased the staff of the library, and the activities of the library when it does indeed cost more tax dollars. They did it because they had the support of the community at every turn. Right from when they had the referendum to start a new library district, 1964, a referendum for a bond issue and a tax rate to build the library, 1995, a referendum to pass an $8.8 .8 million bond issue for that construction, and in 2003, they passed an operating referendum to increase the maximum tax rate from 0.281 to 0.331. The community has supported the increase in the size of the library at a new turn. The reason there isn't another one to add here is we have not needed to do it. We are basically very frugal, and we have not needed another referendum since then. The district also has continued to expand its footprint, and in this map, which I apologize for the quality of it, but a staff member cobbled it together from Google Maps. It shows that the blue here was the original uh, Niles Library District. Then in the 1970s, they added this part here in the green. It partly was to keep up with the um, additions to the village of Niles, but in all of the cases, with all of these additions, the voters of those areas and the village of Niles had to agree to add those people to the district. Those people requested to become members of the district and to pay taxes because they wanted to be part of the public li our public library. So um, you can see here, this is the blue is the original, the green is the 70s, gold is the 1980s, the pink is where they did a referendum to, for annexing this part, and these parts did not get to the number of votes that they needed, partly because you had to be contiguous. All of the votes had to be contiguous with the boundaries of the currently existing district, and you can see that up here, those uh, parts were very far away, so it pulled the whole thing down. The 1980s, um, they did get the school <coughs> part, and then the red parts are the parts where there were parts of the district that then um, were annexed by other communities by the village of Glenview and the city of Des Plaines. So they became no longer part of our district. Um, so things over time have changed. Computers have changed everything. You can see sort of the 1990s style of computer there. Computers have changed every aspect of life these days. And so the boards knew that we needed to have computers and that they needed to be up to date. Uh, social media has changed the way people communicate with each other. There's a tremendous shift in technology these days. People's jobs have altered a great deal. There is no longer the assurance that you'll go work for a big corporation and have lifetime employment. As many of you know, they, many people now are in business for themselves. They're consulting. Many times they're working from their home. And a lot of people these days are also looking for a third place. They're looking for a place to go since their work has become very individual. They want a place to go that's not home, it's not work, it's a place to go and be with other people, and the library makes the perfect third place. So thanks to the forward-thinking boards that we've had, our community has been very well prepared for the future at every turn. I think they've done a fantastic job. I really admire those boards. So there have been more changes in society. Uh, back in the night in 1960, as Mr. McCullough was saying, we had they had to buy books. That was basically it: books, newspapers, magazines. Then, um, in the decades in between, there are some formats that they had to buy that are obsolete now. We had big VHS collections, record albums, cassettes. I'm putting CD-ROMs in this category because I think CD-ROMs are very, very close to obsolete. Now in 2017, we have books, newspapers, magazines, all the things we had in 1960. Plus, we had CDs, e-books, e-audiobooks, DVDs, Blu-rays, playaways, and streaming. And not only do we have books, but we have them in all these different formats. We have 
e-books here. This is from Overdrive. The audio books for the people that want to listen. We have a large print version of this, a regular version of this, and a book on CD of this. And this is James Patterson, who you probably all know is incredibly prolific. And every time he comes out with something, we have to buy multiple copies of all of these things. So the kinds of things that we're having to buy has expanded tremendously. But, you know, some people that are, have vision problems, they love to look at things on tablets. Uh, they might need the large print. We have just all kinds of different needs in the community. Um, on the other hand, a lot of things have not changed. And I think this is an important point because it keeps coming up. Delivery service. Delivery service actually began at this library over 50 years ago, the same year that the library building opened. They have always had delivery service. They um, began an outreach department to focus on that in 1981, so 30 years ago, to handle homebound deliveries. We've gone through multiple bookmobiles. At times when budgets got tight, bookmobiles were cut out, and now we just deliver from a van. But we have had delivery services for the entire time that this library has existed because of the shape of the district and that we need to get service to all of the taxpayers, not just the ones that live close to the library. Running a library has become a very complex thing. There are a lot of services and programs and materials that we have to offer. So how do we decide what to offer? Uh, we have guidance from the Secretary of State, who is also the state librarian. That would be Jesse White. Um, he works through the Illinois State Library. I do not have a logo for them because they don't have a logo as far as I can see. Uh, they work also with the, the State Library and also works with the Illinois Library Association and they've created the standards for Illinois public libraries, which every trustee receives when they become a trustee. Um, and it, it's very detailed sets of standards for each possible thing that a library could be concerned with. And we're going to be talking about that a little bit more in the per capita grant uh, item after this. So residents and even board members sometimes wonder why we've gone so far outside the parameters of just lending books. They sometimes say disparagingly, the library is turning into a community center. And I will argue that that is a very good thing, that the library should be turning into a community center. And here are a few examples of that. When I began as the head of youth services in the year 2000, I immediately began developing that department as a destination. I added games puzzles, educational activities, all sorts of things for parents and children to do together, grandparents and children. I made it a place to go, and immediately we saw things like divorced parents, dads who had visiting time with their kids, they would come to the library to do that time. We started programs like Baby Time, which we were the first library to do that, and it's now been adopted by all the surrounding libraries which is very much tied to the library's mission. It is introducing babies to literacy through the ways that they learn, which is singing and listening and activities. We have action rhymes for them. And we also made it so that the second half of it was a playtime, using toys that were developmentally appropriate so that people could meet the other people in the community. Because being new parenthood can be very isolating. The attendance of that program so far just in the 2017 1,547 babies and adults. It is a very, very popular program. So I think all of those people would say, community center, yes, that's a great thing. The Veterans History Project would be another example of something that where it's not lending materials, why is a library doing this? But as you can see from the picture on the left here, back in its heyday when we had the most people coming to the Veterans History Breakfast and they all come <coughs> and they talk a little about their experiences, there were 36 of them this was last year. So you can see the, that year there was a back row, there was a front row, and those people are gone now. They have died. But thanks to the hardworking librarians of adult services, we have their stories. They've been recorded, we have their oral histories, and they are on the Library of Congress's website in, in addition to being available to the citizens of Niles. And some of them actually filled, did their military service here in Niles, which is particularly fascinating to us. But it was very time consuming, and so the people that are real purists about what a library would be, should be, would say we should not have been doing this. And now we have the technology equipment. I see the 3D printer as the 2017 version of the motto, to preserve the common good is divine. Everyone doesn't need to have a 3D printer in their house, but they need to have access to a 3D printer. Oh, well, 
only if they don't want to lag behind all of the other communities. That's, I think it's, it's proved itself that it's something that people need. Um, all ages, all cultures, all income levels learn and grow here. We've got seniors, we've got people from all kinds of different communities learning all kinds of things. And by the way, we still have lots and lots of books. So my question to you is, what is this board's vision of the library? Now that we have our new name, we're entering a new age, what's your vision? Interesting for that presentation, that historical information. I, I never saw some of those photos or awesome. uh, those charts before. And photos in particular were, were really fun to look, to look at and see. And uh, I think we can take a little bit of uh, time now to just talk about what our individual vision is for the library, what we think the library should do. And, and I very much uh, believe that the library serves the community as a whole to try and serve all elements of the community and should, should very much try to educate and in other ways allow the community to educate itself and serve itself and to preserve knowledge and uh, information. And I think the Veterans History Project does that by preserving information and knowledge that otherwise probably no one was going to preserve. No one else was going to capture that information and, and keep it here. Um, and I also think that, that the Niles uh, Library does serve, in a sense, as a community center. It serves as a place where people can get together and learn about things together. I've been here to many, many classes uh, where a variety of people have come here and learned about a lot of different things. Uh, just last night I attended a, a very interesting program on Medicare. Not that I'm that old, but my husband is. So um, that was fascinating. I've been to many computer classes here, many history classes here. Uh, the programs I've attended have always been well attended, and the public seems to be very grateful that they have this opportunity to learn here and get more information here, be it through books, be it through lectures, be it through CDs or other materials uh, that the library has and allows various members of the public uh, to check out. Um, so I, I do see my vision of the library as being a, a broad vision of uh, what the library can do to serve the members of this district. So um, I'll just go around and if anyone else wants to articulate uh, what their vision is for the library and how you know broad or restrictive it is. Um, I want to give you an opportunity to do that now. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, obviously the library can't be all things to all people, but we have to try to be as many things as we can to as many people as we can. This clearly is a community center. It is really our only community center that's open to all age groups. We have the senior center, but that's restricted to people of a certain age group and certain hours. Uh, uh, the park district has their facilities, but you have to pay for them. Uh, you know, we don't, Niles doesn't have any other area that allows for people to meet uh, unrestricted, you know, out, uh, within the times of the library. But uh, it's the only place we have it. We put on the Shakespeare program, it's packed. So clearly the residents want that. We, uh, oh my gosh, the fan, Fandom Fest, 700 people were here. Uh, clearly that's what the residents want. So, you know, we, we can sit back and say, uh, you know, I guess we shouldn't be doing that, but our, our job is to represent as many people as possible and uh, as many opinions as possible. And they are all, they're very conflicting, so we do have to come up with a way to to, to accommodate the, uh, our, our community. And this uh, library, I think, is doing a fantastic job. Uh, and I want to continue having it do what it's doing. Anyone else? Oh, I'll throw it to you. Okay, go ahead, Dennis. So, uh, <coughs> I, I've uh, never been one to criticize the programs that we have. I think they're all good. Good programs. My my concern is the cost. And uh, when we reference the fact that we've had referendums, that people all agree, I have to ask our good library friends if they know the total number of people in the library district. But I know the people that vote is a mere couple thousand. 
So there's a lot of people who are oblivious to what's going on. They've got their heads down. They're doing other things. Much, much like myself. I, I, I just, you know, things pass me by. So, so when we try to be things for everybody, you know, we're, we're capturing a small piece of it because if only a couple thousand are voting on those referendums. We open our library up to everybody. We don't say no to anybody. So, you know, we get a lot of people from Chicago and other surrounding communities, which is nice for the programs, but it still relates back to the cost. So, uh, you know, there's a number of things that have transpired. We talked about how... Uh, you know, we've gone from books and magazines and so on. But, you know, as we went to those electronic formats, those electronic formats aren't requiring as many people. So there's a lot of automation. So we've had automation. The, the e-books, there's nobody here checking out an e-book. I know they may be buying them and adding them. But, you know, again, that's, you know, I'm not, I'm not directing you guys where to, to make your cuts. Uh, I... And, and how much to cut, but uh, I just think it needs to be considered. Uh, I think if we're going to call ourselves a community center and, and, and be those things, we should change the name. We should change it from library to community center, quite frankly. And I'm, I'm, I'm not being sarcastic there at all, you know, because it's, it's not a library. It's not a library. You know, there's a lot of programs. Giving out sandwiches during the summer recess time period, again, not funded by the library, but it does happen here, and they're going to increase it to three times a week next year, I think. Uh, not a library. I, you know, those are good programs. They're good programs. I agree. The things that you guys are doing, I'm not criticizing. You know, uh, my buddy over here at marketing does a great job at marketing, but do we have to have four people in marketing? I don't know. I, I'm not here, and that's not for me to decide. That's for you guys to decide. You know, how much needs to be done. Um, you know, so I, I think we see these big numbers of people attending, 700 people from Fame and Fest. I, I still am unclear as to how many people were really Niles people versus Chicago. And, and again, it was a great program. I came here, was enjoying it immensely. Good program, but, you know, and, and a cost. There's a cost be behind these programs. And I realize that because I, I go back to my business background where projects or programs, whatever you want, uh, you, you need to understand what those programs cost to run. And, and, and by understanding what it costs to do those programs, so if you're going to do an outreach and have employees from our library go to other school libraries, I'm not sure that they're best serving our uh, people in the library at the time if they're going out to other libraries. Maybe perhaps that's uh, some folks that, you know, could be uh, looked at. But again, I'm not the director, I'm not the business manager. I'm just, I'm just saying that in order to keep our budget flat, we should be looking at what wonderful programs we want to keep. They are good programs, trust me. I, I know a lot of time goes, thought goes into all the programs and I, I've seen the marketing. You know, uh, and I'm not here a whole lot, so I have probably this much understanding of what all those are. So I just think we have to be careful on cost. Okay, all right, thank you, Diane. Um, I'll agree with Dennis. We have wonderful programs. And our library is an investment, really. It's an investment in our community. We give free lunches, but this is okay. I, I didn't say it wasn't. Yeah, I, I, I did not say it. We offer many different things for many different people, many different cultures, many different ages. Yes, it's we should. okay. Yes, we should. We go out to the community. We work with the fire department. We work with nursing homes, we work with public schools, this is good. I think Susan explained the many things that a library, our library, has accomplished and changed over the years. Well, people, um, library users now are not interested in the traditional library. This is the future. 
we are headed towards the future. We have a great beginning, and we have to continue. And we want to be a little pocket in a minute so many other libraries that are doing all of the same things that we are doing. And then we will be a little pocket that won't do any of those things. I didn't no. say not to do that. Well, I said pick I'm, and choose. I'm not so sure you didn't say that. No, no. I, I said pick and choose. I'm concerned about cost. Cost, definitely. I mean, I'm concerned about where my next paycheck is coming from as well. Very cool. I mean, we all do that. But what I is that the only concern? Sorry, I don't know. You know, Susan has done a great job, I think, and she shows us every month how one department saves thousand dollars, another department saves fifty dollars. But I mean, the staff is made aware of uh, costs. I think she's done a good job showing us how money is spent. Um, Um, I just think that our library is an excellent library and I support everything that's been done so far and I'd like to see it continue. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on really everything everyone said, but um, I, I, first of all, I think our new mission really says it all. Um, I know it's very general, but um, just to kind of expand on it is important to building communities I think for me, that's my vision. Um, I think it's very important for us to um, have a balance, but I think that you guys are doing well for a balance. I think the one thing you didn't include, like when you said you had to purchase all the formats, was also all the languages right. that you need to add, because we do have so many cultures. I mean, you go to Manny's, they have 50 flags. Uh, is it like 50 flags? I think it's even more than that. Oh, okay, so it's long. okay, it's it's more than that. <coughs> it's tremendous different types of cultures that live in our community. Maine East is our high school. This is our high school. I mean, so seriously, and I and I want the kid, the other librarians to come to Maine South when they're there in Maine East, and, and we need that community effect and that appeal. We need to appeal to all cultures, all ages, all perspective, all languages. Um, Again, I think what people are forgetting that why people move in this neighborhood and why we move and what people always look for when we move is what school district are we in? What does the library district, what kind of a park district are we in? Those are the three things that why people move into a community. Library is definitely part of that and we have an awesome library and I want to keep it that way because I think that makes my property values go up for a little amount of bang for my buck. I think we have a very low cost for, for the amount of money of, that we get back. So that's all I have to say. Okay. All right. Unless there's any other uh, comments, we can move on. Um, the next item for Susan uh, is to review the issues for capital grant requirements. Okay. The capital grant um, we have to apply for every year, and every year they set a certain number of things that we have to do in order to get it. It's coming around to you now. Um, so for fiscal year 2018, okay. um, so I referred in the presentation to this. Thank you. Thank you. I referred in the presentation to this book, The Standards for Illinois Public Libraries, and every year we have to review a section of it. This year, the section that we have to review is uh, Chapter 12 on safety. So we have already been working on this some. Um, as I put in my director's report, Cindy is going to be chairing a safety committee that has already done quite a lot of work. Um, and then uh, we will, um, under continuing ed, Staff and trustees will complete at least one free online education opportunity focusing on safety in the library. So I have already located a uh, webinar that's coming up next month led by the person that wrote this book on library security. And he is going to be doing a webinar and I will send you guys the link to that. There are other possible library safety things that you might be able to see, but this one is the one that I happen to know about. So all of you will have to sit through something like that at least. 
Um, I don't. It, it hasn't done it yet. It actually hasn't actually taken oh, place yet. Okay. It's so it's sort of, is it something we could do for during a meeting, or would it be? Probably uh, it's probably more well, like an hour. Okay. I mean, maybe, but yeah. Okay. Fine. And then the last thing that we're going to have to do. Oh, the trustees are going to have to. There's another book. Oh yeah, this one. Trustee facts files. The trustees are your assignment is going to be to read the first five chapters of this, which also is laying out responsibilities. And, Sorry, you've got homework. <laughs> Are you going is to there a test for you? Are you the books? Yes, I'll make sure that you guys have the books. We already have the green book, and I'll make sure you all have the trustee facts. When do we have to do that by? Um, well, my deadline for submitting this is January. So I'm just giving you a, a, a heads up here. Um, and then the last thing is that uh, library staff and trustees will familiarize themselves with services provided by the Illinois State Library Literacy Program on the Illinois State Library page. So those will be our requirements for this year, and I just wanted you to be aware that you're going to have some responsibilities to carry out before I can file that uh, grant application. And how much is that grant worth? Uh, it's different every year. It's how much the state decides to give us. Mm -hmm. Last year, I think it was 75 cents per person that lives in the district. So, but but we actually don't have it. So you know, it's theoretical money at this point. Okay. We have a letter saying we've been awarded it. And normally we have gotten it by the end of June, and we have not gotten it this year. Actually, we didn't do it next year, right? I mean, I don't remember. Um, like trustees had I, you know, I don't remember. This. I don't remember there being anything particular that you had to do last, right. last year, but it was. This is actually spelled out three years in advance, uh, so okay. it's maybe a little clearer this year. So you would like give us an email or something? Yes, I will give you everything that you need to carry out your responsibilities. Thank you. I promise. <laughs> Yeah, large. <laughs> yeah, large. And in an evil. Okay. All right. So I think that's all that we need to do. Just review yes. that, and then we move on to item C. Um, so uh, we are going to discuss and vote on the levy ordinance. So do I have a motion to adopt Ordinance 17 07 which is an ordinance levying assessing taxes in the Niles Main District? Library, depending on for the fiscal year beginning July 1 and ending July 30th, 2018. Do I have such a motion? No, I make a motion. Okay, second. I think uh, Tim made the motion, Linda seconded the motion. So uh, we do have a motion on the table, um, and we do have a proposed um, uh, uh, levy amount, is, uh, ordinance rather, shown in um, our book here, um, and, pardon? 49. 49? Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Right. Um, so we have an opportunity to discuss this. Now, we all did discuss this last uh, meeting, mm -hmm. and I want to give people an opportunity to discuss it again if they wish to do so, but given that we had an opportunity to discuss it once and given the late hour, I'm going to ask that uh, trustees confine their remarks to about three minutes, um, just because yeah, it is sense. getting a little bit later. Yeah. Okay? All right, fine. So we have a motion on the table, and um, so does does anyone want to uh, offer any comments? Yes. Of course. So I, I would like to actually make a motion to delay the vote. Uh, and, uh, until we get an opportunity for somebody to uh, take a, a quick look at uh, what we could do to keep the cost uh, down so that we wouldn't have to raise the tax levy. So that, that would be my suggestion. Uh, I think it would be to our advantage if uh, we did that. I also think it would be to our advantage next year that we, we uh, explore uh, what we think uh, is going to be needed uh, you know, before we approve a budget. I, I surely didn't approve a budget and then think, oh, well, I'm going to approve the budget, but we're going to take out the taxpayer credit card uh, and cover it. So uh, that was that was not my understanding. Again, new guy, new guy, not understanding all the stuff that's going on. So uh, disappointed I didn't catch that on my own. So. Um, okay, Dennis, I'm going to construe your motion to delay as a motion to table. Yeah. Uh, but it would need a Thanks. second. Yes. If that's, uh, and then we would vote on your motion. Oh, I'll second that. Okay, fine. All right, so we have a motion to table um, the um, uh, motion to adapt the levy. And I, mean, I just do want to remind uh, board members that this uh, is something that there is 
sensitive. But it's time sensitive. You can't put this off. And, and Do you know what the time is? Yeah. Um, like the second, the first Tuesday of mm -hmm. December? Is that second Tuesday of December. Okay. All right. So um, the motion that's on the table right now is to table, or not to table. Um, so um, may How I have... Can I ask I thought we tabled it already. Yeah. And the reason being you want someone to I look at other alternatives. Yeah. And who would get someone... Uh, well, the, it, it should be the library. I mean, the library has control of or the, the knowledge of, of what they, you know, they have out there. So, you know, I, I don't think it, you know, other trustees would have that knowledge. Uh, you know, when I, when I build a budget, I, I build it based on an understanding of this is what's happening in my library. But good question. Okay. Did, it, did I answer it? Yes. Okay. All right. So we have a motion to table. Um, would you call the roll? So wait, what, what is yes and what is no? Uh, to table <laughs> would be yes. To not table would be no. So if you want to delay, if you want to delay acting on this motion, you would vote yes. If you don't, if you want to deal with it tonight, you would vote no. Okay, so tonight is a no. Table is a yes. Okay. Karen? No. Carolyn? Yes. Dennis? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to throw Dr. Fuller's suspense. Diane? No. you got to have fun. you got to have some fun while you're calling the line. No. Linda? No. Tim? Tim no. Oh, come on. Okay. So the motion to the table uh, has that passed. So the motion to actually pass the levy remains on the table. And if anyone wishes to discuss the uh, levy itself, um, they have an opportunity to do so now. Carol. I have a question. Somewhere does it tell us exactly how much this levy increase is? What's the total amount? Do we know that? Uh, well, if we're looking at page 49 through uh, 52. There's the on page 51. Uh, okay, the, the total total is at the bottom of page 51, mm -hmm. and it's approximately 6.85 million, correct? That's right. That's the increase of the levy? No, no that's, that's not the total. increase, that is the levy. Oh, I'm that just asking that. how much, what is the 2.1% increase? That's all I wanted to know. Right. Um, I can't tell you that specifically, but I can tell you that last year's, uh, last year's total, uh -huh. The six million seven eighteen four seventy four. So subtract the two, and that'll be my two point one percent. Yeah. No, 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 don't. No, you're not. Remember, it's six point seven one times. So you're not adding point two point. Well, the six point seven one is analogous to the six point eight five. Right. Six point eight five. Okay. Or six point eight five. Right, yeah, right. Okay, can I, all right, so I can pick up last year's figure where, and where is that? I just said it. I just can, you, it you. can you give it to me so I can put it in my calculator so I can come up with that, please? Let's 6 million, just, 718. 718. Go ahead. Oh, that's it, even? Well, 474. Oh, sorry. Okay. And I'm going to subtract this 6 million, too? No. No, you don't, you don't subtract. Well, no, he already, already did. did he yeah, already did it. Okay. But I'm just going to subtract 45 or something. Yeah, it's, it's in the local. So, Greg, I'm subtracting yeah. 68.59, right? That's the number? Mm -hmm. Thank you. 562. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Well, uh, Carolyn is losing her question okay. later. All right, so the, the, the total increase. Of the levy is one hundred and forty-one thousand dollars eighty one thousand one hundred forty-one thousand eighty-eight dollars. All right, and then I just wanted to make one mention of the general fund projection, which we talked about last month. Again, if we if we look at um, the budget of uh, the levy not changing at all, um, we would not see a deficit until 2021-22. And then it would only be four thousand dollars. Now, one hundred and forty-one thousand dollars really isn't an exorbitant amount of money. 
I would think maybe we could think of some ways to cut and not need to raise the levy and work within our means because it's not such a large amount. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that's right. my comment. All right, no, Caroline, that, that's fair. Um, and you're getting that uh, amount from the tax levy discussion that we had last month. You Is mean the correct? general fund? Yes, if you the look at you're looking at last yes, month. Yes, the last column. But there's only a four thousand dollar difference. Right, right, right. Well, um, it, and I, I would just like to respond to that, although others can also um, come in, too, before we vote. Um, one reason I was concerned about this uh, is that I am very worried about our ability to raise taxes in future years, uh, given that um, Governor Rauner has, uh, and, and the Illinois legislature has addressed a couple of bills which would freeze property tax and make it impossible for us to raise the levy in the future. Senate Bill 482 would have frozen the levy for 2017 and 2018, two years. There was another bill that would have frozen us for four years. That means we would have been stuck at zero for four years. Now, that didn't actually pass, but I think certainly Rauner and I think many members of the Illinois legislature have been uh, indicated that they're seriously considering doing that. So I feel that um, we are, under current law, able to raise our levy um, in accordance with the cost of living, 2.1%. Uh, and that we, we should do that now because I'm not sure we'll be able to do it next year or the year after that or the year after that. I understand. And, that, and that's my concern. Uh, actually, Carol, I, I agree with you. We're not going to run into horrible problems this very next year. But uh, my main reason, or one of my main reasons for voting for this, is I am concerned about our continuing ability to raise taxes in the future, and if we might have our hands tied by the Illinois legislature. Which, and I just as an aside, think it's very ironic that the Illinois legislature legislature raises Illinois taxes, but at the same time turns to local taxing bodies and says you can't raise yours at all. So, but that's that's neither here nor there. So anyway. Um, I, again, uh, throw it up to the floor, floor if anyone else would like to discuss the levy. You know, I honestly came in last month thinking I wanted flat and did not want to raise. I was not for it. However, after listening to the presentation, and I will piggyback on what Karen said about the um, possible Illinois tax break that scares me to death, that we will be flat. And not only about that is what Niles is doing with the TIF districts. It, after I read what it, actually that means, because I didn't really understand it completely, that was really actually well written and well explained. Um, I did not understand how it, the money gets diverted. I thought it was just not money taken, but it's diverted. Wow. Okay. So um, that too was a reason why I am for it. For the, and it is. I don't want to say measly or mere or low. It is what it is. It's $141,000, but it's something that will hopefully hold us through just in case, you know, um, everything else falls in place. That is a possibility. Right now, we're such in a variable stage. It's, it is unfortunate we're in an unsure time, and we have to vote on the cause of caution to be fiscally responsible in my eyes. Any other comments? Well, I wanted oh. to make a comment. Yeah, Diane has uh, Yes, go ahead. Yeah, well, we didn't talk about it, but in the report, the maintenance was mentioned as far as future main, uh, maintenance of our building. And they, these figures made me decide we definitely need to do them. Are those covered, though? Uh, could you help us understand? Yeah, we have a, um, a fund called the uh, Special Reserve Fund. Yeah. In the special reserve fund, we've anticipated a lot of things like yeah. replacing the chiller, yeah. uh, like painting. Yeah. Um, I can't remember if caulking is in there specifically, uh, or replacement of uh, the roof on the uh, uh, on the portico. Um, but um, you know, when we did do it, we did have a project list. Uh, yeah. That project list changes yeah. um, as things come up sooner, uh, or later or right. not at all, right. yeah, or we get, we get good experience as far as cost is concerned. So, you know, the board at any time can put money into the uh, special reserve fund, it can never come out. So we're careful about transferring yeah. funds to it. Um, and um, at some point, you know, we ought to uh, take another look at it and make sure that there is enough money in there. 
when money does go in there, it comes out of the general fund. So, uh, yeah, I hope they have it. Yeah. Okay. And you had mentioned once before about the cost of repairing the entire But it's done in sections, so, right? Yeah, it's, um, and I think I think the total cost we reserved um, is it's multiple hundreds. It might be as much as eight hundred altogether. So it's it's pretty significant. That's important. Right, but the thing is, if we only always have what's in the general and take for trip what's in the general fund and never have extra to be able to put into the special reserve fund, then. All that money is going to be depleted. We won't have anything there. So okay. we have to remember that you have to have a little cushion to know that we have that opportunity. Well, we need to continue. Uh, we need to continue. Two years ago. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. So I think Tim had to say a little while. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh. No, that's fine. Um, yeah, I look at this as a, as a regular cost of living. Um, if you're an employer. And all the residents are employers, essentially, of, of the library staff. Um, you give your, your employees uh, a cost of living. This is the way we fund it. We don't have any other mechanism for obtaining funds other than through our taxing uh, body. Also, I uh, echo uh, uh, Linda's um, statement about the tips. That's a, a real uh, issue for us. Uh, Village of Niles looking to create four more TIFs. We have no ability to affect that one way or the other. They can do that as they wish, and it does take money directly out of our fund. So, so how does that work? And so I have heard you know, a little bit about the TIFs, but how does that So work? my understanding, they create a TIF district yeah. that freezes the, the uh, real estate tax for the uh, buildings in that district. Yeah. As the value increases, their uh, their uh, real estate amount increases that, that uh, yeah. incrementally, and the increase is taken out of the taxing body's funds and put into a special account that the village then uses to um, develop. Yeah. So it's actually taken out of our funds, right? And and give it we to have, the village. Give it to the village. We have no authority. We don't get those those dollars. Dollars. Whose funds are they taking? All right, the the library. Well, all the, the library. All the taxi bodies. All the taxi bodies. So, yeah, so for that district. It's you know it's school districts, yeah. it's the high school right. districts, it's yep. the mosquito abatement district, it's the library district, it's the village. Uh, the, the village is actually giving money, uh, but you know they have other money coming in. And uh, uh, this past year, this past levy year, 2016, the village had two TIF two TIF districts. Uh, one that's premature, um, and one um, that is only about a year old. Uh, in total, between the two of them, uh, they had receipts of $3.6 million. So $3.6 million came out of everybody's uh, tax levy mm -hmm. to the library. Uh, $3.6 million plus us, $200,000. Okay. okay. So about $200,000. Right. The danger is... Uh, that the uh, newer TIF district has only started to increase in value. Last year alone, it went from uh, an assessed equalized value of, or an equalized assessed value of 38 million to about 50 million. Their target is somewhere around 80 million or so. So if you take last year's tax rate, which was 0.44%, and you apply it to the you know to the increases and so forth, that two hundred thousand just on those two districts balloons to three hundred and fifty thousand. So for two hundred thousand so a year. Increase of, yeah. A year. Yeah. Um, and then So why um, why would they put tips out there? The life the excuse me, the life of a tip yeah. is twenty three years. Okay. So depending on I'm not you know it, the slope of the curve will tell us a lot. Right. But that's not information that I have in terms of what the development is. And so forth. So, so. But if it gets to the terminal value, let's say within the next few years, that'll probably run for another 18 years or so. Now, what's on the boards are four new districts, which basically tie up all of the commercial property on Milwaukee Avenue. Yeah. And what I don't know is enough about those valuations and so forth, which would, and their plans for increasing the value to predict with any degree of reliability, what 
what kind of impact they may have. So, so, so with the impending possible tax, tax freeze, why would our producingly responsible Niles government put all these tips in place at the same time? Well, they, they get to give things to the people, and they don't have to pay for it. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, that's what it is. I mean, that's what <laughs> Do we get that on camera? <laughs> well, it's also no, it's no, 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 but it's, it's right. to, to improve the, the, the area. It, you know, it, yeah, I know. But you, can't, you can't always continue to give and give and give. So uh, just, just to bring our discussion back to yeah, the lobby, I to make very good. Thank are, you for explaining uh, that. Tips are important to us, and they do affect us. So just bringing back, do I have any other uh, comments or questions before we move on to a vote? Uh, Patty, you looked like you wanted to say uh, something. I am, I think majority of what I wanted to say has been expressed. Okay, all right, fine. And I only wanted to mention one other thing, and, uh, and that is that, you know, I know tax increases are, are, are hard on uh, tax increases, particularly those on a limited income or fixed income. But, you know, I, I just read in the past week that the Social Security is raising benefits uh, following the cost of living increase. And, and I think uh, our employees, they're all entitled to a cost of living increase, too, and maybe a tiny little bump for their long service, too, or, you know, their increased uh, uh, proficiency, too. So I, I think that it's appropriate for that reason also to, uh, to make sure that we have uh, the income and the funds to cover uh, those raises and salaries, which certainly aren't extravagant, but help our employees keep up with the cost of living. All right. Can uh, I just chime in on a comment for the community as a whole? Um, I don't know if you are all aware of this, but the homeless rate in Niles has increased substantially. There are so many families, so many people who are homeless, it's unbelievable. And I know apparently it's not something we all realize, but Niles is really, a lot of people in Niles are struggling more than you can imagine. And yes, I think our employees deserve a COLA raise, cost of living raise, but you, I, and people say it's just 141000 but there are so many people out there who are really struggling. And so many people don't realize it because we all look like we're doing just so fine. But sometimes we really need to take a deeper look at our community and how it truly is struggling. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. Well, I, yeah, I really didn't realize we, we had that many homeless It's people. amazing. But uh, the library is a place that can serve them, a place that they can go in and get, you know, all the services for free. So that's one way we serve them. All right, okay, I, I think uh, we've all had a chance to express ourselves again, so I'm going to ask for a roll call. Karen? Yes. Carolyn? No. Dennis? No. Danielle? Yes. Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Tim? Yes. Okay, that passes and we turn to the next item. Uh, do I have a motion to transfer um, 500000 from, let's see, to the Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund. And if I have a motion to that effect, I think Greg will explain a little bit more why we're doing this now. Okay, I'll motion just a second. Okay, we have that on the table. Greg, we did talk about this uh, last year, uh, and actually last year we wanted to, I actually wanted to transfer this 500000 last year, but we, we, we couldn't do it at that time. But now you're bringing it to our attention again. And would you particularly, for the, especially for the benefit of the new people, explain uh, why we have this remainder of 500,000 that we're um, transferring to IMRF. Uh, certainly. So, um, after all of the uh, employees who wanted to buy their past service went ahead and exercised their rights to past service, uh, the IMRF uh, did a uh, liability calculation, an unfunded liability calculation, and it ended up that we were we were around two and a half million dollars. Um, two and a half million what? Dollars. What, underfunded? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, so the way that it works, Dennis, is that on day one, um, all of the employees who were eligible for IMRF were given, uh, by, you know, by the IMRF arrangement, 20% of their past service uh, for no cost to them. Oh, okay. okay. That created a, um, 
uh, immediate unfunded liability of about $900,000. Once the employees purchased all of their gas service that they wanted to, there's no more out there that hasn't been purchased. Uh, that liability increased to two and a half million dollars. Um, yeah, on, on an unfunded liability, the IMRF charges seven and a half percent interest. As a matter of fact, they charge uh, their target is seven and a half percent. And if they don't earn that in the market, yeah. what they do is they increase rates so that so that they stay on on projection. Okay. The good news is, as a side note. Uh, so far this year in calendar 2017, they're at about 7.4 percent, and if the markets uh, stay where they are or, or increase, uh, they'll be better off. Last year we were just a little bit over their target of 7.5 percent, so there's, there's no add to that. Um, near the end of last calendar year, the board decided to put $2 million into the IMRF to basically offset that unfunded liability and turn it to a $500,000 unfunded liability. The reason that we only made the $2 million uh, contribution or transfer is because that's what was in the appropriation from last yeah. year. Yeah. We couldn't exceed that. Right. Not without a lot of, you know, right. a lot of, a lot of uh, rigor ball. Yeah. So by making that $2 million transfer, we ended up avoiding the, the charge of $150,000 per year. Now, it's $150,000 per year in the short term because the way that what they do is they actually amortize over 28 years, kind of like mortgage, yeah. so that over time uh, it's reduced and actually paid into the fund. But that money has to come from somewhere, and what it would do is it would come from the uh, operations of the library as in, you know through increased rate, through increased matching rate. <coughs> what we saw, what we saw so far in terms of the library's matching rate, is that we started at eight point one two percent, which which takes us to the end of twenty seventeen. On January first, oh. the rate goes to seven point three one percent. That differential. Why did it go down? Because we made the two million dollar. Okay. We made the two million dollar contribution. Um, the differential applied to our payroll does not equal one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We have to look at where the rate would have been. The rate would have been if we had made no uh, contribution whatsoever, no extra contribution whatsoever. The rate would have gone up to thirteen point seven percent. The difference between the thirteen point seven and the uh, seven point three one is approximately one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay, so we were able to reduce current costs by making this contribution. Um, this year, during the budgeting cycle, we put half a million dollars in the um, uh, in the budget to eradicate the balance of the unfunded liability uh, because the contribution is smaller. Yeah. Uh, the benefit is smaller to the tune of thirty uh, thirty-seven thousand five hundred. Yeah. Okay. For a total of one hundred eighty-seven thousand five hundred annually. So the money's already been budgeted for, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, what I do want to point out is um, actuarial uh, uh, assessments uh, tend to be a moving target. So, uh, Karen, this is important. Um, the five hundred thousand dollars that we were short last year is really like five hundred and thirty-two. Now it is. Now it is. Right. Okay. And uh, because five hundred was budgeted, right. I wrote the motion for five hundred. Okay. Um, you know, you you may want to entertain five hundred and. Uh, well, I want to pull, pay the whole thing off. Is what I personally would like to do. Just not have to deal with this again. You might. You may want to entertain five hundred and thirty-two thousand. And I will tell you that, you know, the actuarial evaluations take place far enough apart that other factors, earnings, and people entering and people leaving the plan and so forth, will affect it. So we may be a little over or a little under by the time, you know, by the time we make the uh, transfer. Only only time will tell once the actors get engaged and, and do their evaluation. Um, are, are you sure 532 would be enough then? Yes. I think, 
you know, if, if we're over or under, it's by five digits, probably low five digits. Do we have to change the motion? Could, it, could the motion be uh, between 500,000 and 532,000 in accordance with the amount that is? Uh, I would just make it for 532. It's already been caught for 532, is what it's saying. Yeah. I would just make it for 532. You're sure it's not going to be any lower than that? Uh, I don't know. I don't I'm, not, I'm not trying to be cagey. No, yeah, I know. You know I, 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 that's what I'm saying. I don't want but to if you're, pay them too much. If you're 101 uh, percent funded, what they'll do is take that into consideration in future rates. Okay, and then they'll, they'll oh, so future large. rates will be a little bit even a little It'll bit lower. Benefit so, us for longer. Longer. Right. so you know, it's you know, it's an evening process that you know. I mean, uh, you know, you, you can drive yourself crazy trying to zero in on a target, mm -hmm. but. You can get okay. close, but never. You know, All right. Never. Well, then I would ask the movement. Do you have enough? Is it appropriate enough? Oh, yeah. Do we appropriate enough? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because uh, the appropriation is double what the budget is. Okay. So for this $500,000 item, we actually appropriated $1 okay. million dollars okay. to give us right Okay. Because I think that was the problem last year. Wasn't That's it? exactly yeah. the problem. So uh, I forgot exactly who was the movement and second on that. Yeah, I and think and I was the. Was it Tim and I? Was it Tim and you said? Yeah, it might have been. Oh, wait. Who was it? Was it Tim and me? <laughs> no, it was Linda and Patty. Okay, okay. all right. Also right. Patty and then you second. Well, then I would ask the movement and seconder if they would. Uh, no accept problem. A friendly no. amendment yes. to <laughs> amend the amount to 532000 Yes. Okay. Um, Greg, were you done with your discussion? Yes, unless there are any right. questions. Are there questions? I, I do have yes. a question. Mm -hmm. Greg, we talked about past service, which is the underfunded amount of $2.5 million, and that was determined because we, we just started an IMRF. Okay, the actuarial assessments, when are they done? Uh, they're done for the uh, end of the calendar year. So it's yearly, like... Mm -hmm. The end of June, is that it? Oh, uh, you know, probably sometime in the spring. I, I don't remember exactly when they came out. Oh, calendar year, you yeah. said. Oh, not fiscal. Yeah. Okay, so here's, here's my concern. I'm trying to figure out, um, so this underfunded calculation won't change because the only possibility would be new employees or retirees, right? Which would affect what we have to contribute. Well, there's a, there's a third uh, possibility, and that is that employees who wish to purchase um, past service, uh, you know, they may have only purchased a portion of it, or they may have decided they didn't have the resources and purchased none of it, have the op still have the opportunity to buy their past service up until the day before they retire, or the day before they quit. So when are we obligated to... Like if they buy their past service, is that an additional hit for us that yes. has to be paid immediately? No, or? no, none of it has to be paid immediately. Uh, but paying it, paying it as we are, helps us to keep the rates low. Oh no, I understand, and, say, oh, and I'm not okay. disputing it. What I meant was, let's say in the next two months, somebody's buying back time, somebody's retiring. So does 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 this increase in rates not hit us until? Like the end of the year, or is it unique? You know, when will it hit us? Um, if uh, somebody buys their past service, it'll go into the next calculation, and then we'll be underfunded by by that amount. When does so the capability? In? Excuse me. When does the capability to buy past service in? So the day before correctly. somebody leaves nice. the library. Wow. Deal. Whether they resign, whether they okay. quit. Uh, but explain how it goes up the percentage. Yeah, right. Right. The percentage well, yeah, that you have to pay is. Yeah. Drastically okay. increases so the, the likelihood. That's good. The likelihood is of so remember where I said seven and a half percent? Yeah. If you if let's say your past service is fifty thousand yeah. dollars, in the in the following year it'll uh, be fifty uh, three seven fifty. Got it. In the following okay. year beyond that it'll be another That's you know, right. so so five or six. Yes. Risk goes down. Yes. Risk goes down. Yeah. You know, but you know, people I think um, you know, by and large have uh, just made their decisions and yeah. now they're moving on. Yeah. It's it's hard. I, I would be hard pressed to okay. risk EOS data yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, unless there's any further questions or discussion. No, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Diane, would you please take a roll? Karen. Yes. Carolyn. I'm 
sorry. Yes, I forgot what we were voting on. I'm sorry, yes. Dennis? Yes. Diane? Yes. Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, all right, that passes. And then we move on to our next agenda item, review of administrative policy 3.11, uh, unattended children. So, uh, yes. return to that tab in your book, which is um, on page... Yes. Right, so maybe if you just want to take a look at that to review your, refresh your memory as to what it currently says. I read it again right before I <laughs> All right. Um, this is the policy as it is now. If um, anyone wants to, uh, well, let, let, me, let me ask if I if I can just start out, ask our staff members if we, if we've had any problems uh, with the policy as as written. Has there been any incidents uh, where? The policy as is has maybe caused some problems for the staff or other patrons. I wouldn't say that policy as is has caused any issues. I think that there are kids who are certainly in our space and sometimes act like kids are want to do and we address that behavior and I think the policy as it as it stands um, gives us a baseline and then we also have the support of administration, you know, assessing the situation or what it is and dealing with that specific scenario. Um, we did take a look at some of the area libraries and looked at what their um, ages were for both the unattended individuals and then the assigned age for the caregiver who was in charge of little brothers, little sisters, littles. Um, and it seems like uh, were that we, we if any adjustment was made, that's potentially where that adjustment would be made. Um, a concern that my staff has brought up is not necessarily how um, old or young, you know, like that our ages are fine, but that sometimes kids are here for long stretches of time, and to to address that behavior is not necessarily in the policy. However, it is something that we. Do address, you know, we'll figure out what the phone number is and call and check on, you know, when the grown ups come in. And that child is old enough to be here, but sometimes, you know, it does seem like they, they've been here for quite a long time. Okay. And, and, and to, to manage the, the amount of time a child can be here unintended doesn't seem to be um, addressed in the area policy, in the local area of library policy. And I did check with the um, with the libraries and rails, I got 35 responses, and the average age of the child was nine. So there that was, could be unattended. It could be unattended. Okay. I also called the, um, the free bus, the fitness center, the schools, the park districts, and queried them on how old children could be uh, loose and unattended. And the general consensus on the high on the higher end was 10, um, but Culver School across the street will release a second grader uh, on their own at the end of the day. Those kids are free to make wow. their way wow. to the school and from the school, um, and that is a seven-year-old. So, oh my God. Mm -hmm. well, so there's a range, is what I'm saying. Right. There's a range. I mean, all kids in school, they walk to school from themselves when they were five. I did that when I was five. I I think I think that it should be that the, the school is Axon Local Parentis, um, and we do not. Uh, but this is a supervised space, but we do not take responsibility for the physical safety and well-being of the children in the space. We don't act as a parent as the school. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a bit of an in-between stage. And. Um, can you um, estimate, and, and you probably can, can you estimate how many children we do have in the children's section that... We take hourly counts and, you know, on a, on a hopping mad busy day where the, the, the body count, which is not just children, uh, 
uh, is you know approaching 100, and then on a on a brisk after school um, you know peak hour, it would probably be anywhere between 45 and 65 people in the department. Mm -hmm. You can't really tell. I don't suppose how many people are, how many kids are there with a parent or not. I mean. One I parent may have several kids, and they're probably not sitting together, so it's probably hard to tell. 15 and 20 unsupervised um, after-school kids on a daily basis, mm -hmm. on a school day. Mm -hmm. Do you know, if there, are there some kids that come over from Culver after school mm -hmm. that you just can, cross the street? You can hear them. They race. Fall comes past their window, and we know they're arriving. Uh, they're racing for the, the sweet computer spots or uh, to gain control of the video gaming system. So okay. they, we know they're coming. All right, and they stay, I imagine, for a few hours after school? What we've done this year, um, we figured out that the um, middle ground is best if we do have an adult in there directly supervising that space. And we tend to staff that from 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock uh, on a school day. So that's the, those are the peak after school hours, 3 o'clock. Um, before we actually launch into any further discussion, do we have any more questions of the staff regarding what the situation is? Or? What's the general feeling of the staff? Is there, do they want this policy change? I pulled the staff and the children's staff, most of them like the it being, most libraries don't have it as a grade that we are I, very odd. The help way, everybody else has it as an age, except for Park Ridge, who also has it third grade. Um, but uh, most of the staff wanted it, most of the kids' space staff thought eight was fine, eight is working. A couple of them thought it should be ten. The staff in other departments were like, no, it should be ten, it should be twelve, it should be thirteen, and they should only stay in kids' space. They should have it. So they had a little bit of a, yeah, they had a, little bit of a different view. Uh, feeling a little bit more protective of the children, I think, is part of it. Or of their space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's the liability to the, the library? That, that was why I wanted Dennis to come so we could talk a little bit about that aspect of it. Well, um, what part of it? What part of it? I mean, well, you know, I'm concerned that, you know, we, we set these, these rules based on, you know, understanding of other places. And, uh, you know, I think everybody tries to do the due diligence, but what are we open to if somebody decides to come back and sue the library because someone got hurt and they were unattended? Well, it's, it's very much a fact situation. Okay. So I don't know what, yeah, I have to guess that I know the scenario, but it's very common and reasonable to put an age restriction on yep. kids that are, uh, can be here by themselves and kids that need to have some level of supervision. I think probably in my experience, you talk about an eight or a nine year old, um, and then the supervisor, would, they could be there by themselves, but somebody less than that would have to have like a 16 year old to watch them. I think what I would, what wow. I see, um, I think it would be a, a big liability issue if we had a child that was underage that was left here, and the library closed, and we didn't contact the police, um, and we just let that child out by themselves. That that become a well, liability. I, I, I mean, so that's part of the policy. That's the yeah. 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 And Which is very, very common for my voice. I mean, that's what you do with kids that are left about themselves. We did, we did survey, in addition to the lower um, limit, you know, how old must a child be to stay here, we also looked at policies and compared the upper limit, like how old is a, a reasonable caregiver who would be in charge of young groups. Right. And the average for the um, numbers that we collected was 13. The American Red Cross has a national ba certified uh, babysitter class that um, serve that can be taken by 11 and 12 year olds. Mm -hmm. So at a national level, an 11 year old can be in charge of those. I'm sorry, so can be in charge of what? Little kids. Little kids. Can be, I know, but we still have a state law here, so we need to. Remember well, the that. state law is very ambiguous because basically. It it's uses the word reasonable, and it does not give a definition of the word reasonable. 
and the state librarian, we talked about Jesse White being our state librarian, on, this, on the state site gives a blank unattended child policy and they don't fill in the age of the children. So, so they won't touch it. Touch it. So the state of Illinois does not say 14 right. is... No. Mm -hmm. no. I thought I pulled that up. It doesn't say that it on the state that, of Illinois. It says that you can't leave a 14-year-old alone at home for an unreasonable amount of time. And that okay. the word reasonable... What does that mean? mean? That means... No one's going to commit to that. Use your own discretion. I called the police department when my kids were growing up. And they were like, you know your kids. You leave them as you feel fit. There was this yeah. being a responsible parent. Well, you, you know, know their I abilities. Know kind of agree with you that. know their abilities. That so I was like, okay. Okay, but we're, we're talking <laughs> about leaving <laughs> children at the library, right? Right. Yeah. So, Which so the space is a monitor, but we are not taking individual uh, custody or responsibility. If you so don't agree, with, well, well, you responded to a parent telling her yes, she could leave her daughter there while she went grocery shopping. I think that put us in a state of liability. Are you saying that I told the parents that they could leave their child to A parent came up to you and asked you, weren't you the one who spoke at the last meeting? A she did, but I don't think that's exactly A parent came up to her and said, is it okay if I leave my daughter while I go grocery shopping? And you said yes. Ugh. Under what oh. circumstances? I don't know she came up to you. Wasn't she the initial person and then she looked at you child. and... To be here unattended, then right. the answer is yes. Yeah, I don't know who. Say that again. If the child, if under our policy, the child can, is old enough to remain in the library without a supervisor, then the answer to that question is yes, you can. And then if that. she gets hurt, we're fine. There's no liability simply because we allow the child to come into the library at that age. Okay. We don't act. It, we, don't, we don't step into the shoes of the parents. We don't take responsibility. It's a little bit different in the school. So it's setting, okay if you say are. that. Okay. Oh, good. That's wonderful. I, well, I don't know that it's okay to say that, but I don't think it creates any liability. Well, that's what I meant. That was my only concern. But back to this subject, actually, I did meet with um, Commander Tornaveni at the police department to find out what the age, or appropriate age, is to leave an unattended minor. He was surprised that eight years is the year that we have for children to be unattended. He did pull up some other libraries, and I, I don't know if these are libraries that all of you had um, researched, but other libraries are very specific. They mention the age of the child. And I have Naperville, I have Broadview, and I have something called Haverhill. That's all I have. But all of them say children under age 8 must be under the direct supervision of a parent and another or another responsible adult. And I'm I, I kinda am concerned that eight years old isn't an adult and that we allow them to be here is something we may want to rethink. I think they should be older to be left alone. Not eight years old. Because I still think it falls on our, our staff. Some, if something happens to this child or this child is in need of something. They Simply, have to go to an adult. If, if, if there's something, if a child gets hurt because of uh, construction issue or something, mm -hmm. that's that's one issue. But simply, the the adult, but simply right? correct. But simply allowing a child to be in the library unattended as an eight-year-old doesn't create, in my opinion, any additional liability that you don't otherwise have for somebody else. Isn't that consistent with what you just said the other libraries did? No, they said that um, eight-year-olds need to be supervised under by eight. an adult. Under under eight, 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 said. Oh, children under the age of eight. Okay, that's what this one said. You're right. So children to eight to ten must have a parent or caregiver in the library. Okay. So they all, they all expect an adult to be with them. But then my other thought is, I mean, we have an eight-year-old. That's a little kid in the library. <coughs> Who's looking out for that child's interest? We already had an incident and this girl was older. How do we know this poor little girl won't be subjected to that exposure or picked up and, and left with? I mean, I think there's risks. These are young children. Correct. And from a legal perspective, the liability decision is based, the parent makes the decision as to whether or not they're comfortable leaving the child at that age in the library unattended. Okay. 
that's, that's, that's really where the responsibility okay, lies, that's not for so the library. It's, it's their liability, not ours. Correct. Well, it's okay. their responsibility. They're not going to be liable for being a kid. But it's their responsibility ultimately to decide whether or not they're comfortable okay, then. leaving their child that's at fine. that age in the library. Right, then all I would ask is if that we should rewrite this and be specific instead of calling it third grade, maybe we should put a specific age, whatever it is you uh, mean. I, because I, I just feel like that. it sounds so gray to me. I would like it to be a little more specific. That's all I have to say about it. Then. Okay. I just want to ask one follow-up question. The uh, free bus, what did they say in terms of how long do they have to be or do they even check? They uh, were hesitant to commit. Mm -hmm. They said it's not in writing, mm -hmm. but, uh, and their primary job is to drive the bus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if they notice someone who appears to be younger than 10, and they have a feeling that it should be investigated, they would. And that's largely how we operate. If we, so we have this uh, you know, expectation that they are behaving themselves in the space, and if they are behaving themselves, and if they don't look like you know, a five or six or seven year old that is unaccompanied when you let them go about their way. I think that children benefit from <coughs> trials of measured independence, and I think the libraries are really safe and um, excellent place for that to happen, but they are independent and they're not responsible for them. And, I, I do have concerns if they don't go to the library, some of the kids, where are they going to go? Yeah, I mean, maybe exactly. they maybe don't have a, a supervised home place to go to. Maybe they're wandering the walk mall, maybe they're, I don't know where else. And I, I do feel that the library is probably the best place they could be if not in their own home uh, in terms of doing their homework and, you know, a safe place. So a public place where public place there are some adults yes. around that if right. something right. So, looks um, like tap so, will say something. So, Carolyn, I understand you said that you were interested in changing it to age eight, but I think you ought to remember, some kids are eight and stuff in grade, so, well, I mean, she, you know, if we change it. She has third grade listed there. Right, so, so it, maybe we want to keep it third grade because a lot, well, there are a number of represent? kids. Third grade, what age does that represent? I mean, every eight, other eight, library. Eight, some kids would be nine. But every yeah. library is real okay. specific using an age. We're just not, and I, I just feel like we seem so great, and everyone else is so specific. Well, it, it if can you're be. in third grade, or you're not. Yeah, it, 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 on one hand, you can say you might be an eight-year-old, you might be a nine-year-old, but you know, with the traffic from Culver, those children move as a, as a class. Yeah. They are like a school of fish, and to differentiate in in that same group of kids, uh, do I have to ID them? Do I have to? I know, what, I know what grade they're in. That's evident by their peer group. But mm -hmm. I don't know when their birthday is, and I don't know when that magic date passes, and now they're eligible to be here by themselves. And, but I do know what grade they're in. So it's oh. actually easier to tell. Only for the culvert group. What about all the other children who come here that aren't together? Is, in it, is it mostly culvert that you have this issue with? I, I mean, I say, I, do I they come here that issues. much from, I'm not saying issues. Do you get the East Main 63s and St. John Bree bus? Yes. It's mm -hmm. mostly the kids from Culver's that, Culver that come here. We get a good number of St. John kids. No, uh, that's an increasing population. And then the um, the busing for East Main 63 is termed because they use the same buses for the teens. So those kids tend to get here at the earliest at 430. So, which is why our after school programs don't start until 4.30, but the Culver kids can be here at 3 o'clock. So, just a different okay. intensity. All right. Um, okay. Well, I, you know, just personally, I, I'd like to keep third grade because otherwise we're going to have some second graders over here if uh, we make it age eight, eight. And I don't know that I want to make it any younger than it already is. So, um, any other thoughts or motions or anything, or have we just sort of exhausted this discussion for now? Mm -hmm. All right, I, I think we're done with the discussion for now, from what I hear. Oh, um, where did I put my thing? Do I, then, all right, um, I need to know, do I have a motion to approve the expenditure? Not to exceed $5,807.87 from the special reserve fund 
to extend the wireless network, replace network switches, and replace batteries. Do I have a motion to that effect? Minus one motion. Second. Okay. Uh, any questions? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. So what's the purpose of, you know, the, the wireless uh, extensions? Or is they not working in certain spaces with the library? Or? Um, last year, through the uh, same pro program, the E-rate program, uh, we replaced the uh, 18 access points that we already get. Uh, through the upgrade and the access points, we were able to determine that um, in, in some areas, we get greater uh, demand for wireless connectivity and bandwidth than in other areas. So now, with that information, um, we've uh, decided to expand the network to, uh, by you know, basically a factor of 55%, 10 over 18, to uh, provide wireless service in those areas. The important thing to note is that the total cost of, of the uh, wireless access points with five-year support is $7,000, but the library is only paying 20% of that cost because the balance comes from the federal government through the rebate program. As a matter of fact, um, Rich Wasnichka has you know, spent an incredible amount of time working with uh, the e-rate program and, and bidding this stuff. Last year, we had expenses of $67,000 for both repairs and for um, connectivity charges, telephone and internet uh, charges. And we're, we have gotten, or we are getting, $49,000 back from the federal government. Uh, we're still waiting on a reimbursement for the internet and uh, telephone charges to the tune of $15,429.25, uh, which we should be getting in the next 60 days or so. Yeah, so, you know, we find ourselves in a position where we're, last year we got $67,000 of value and only paid about $18,000 for it. This year, you know, looking at, um, looking at just uh, the equipment purchases for expanding the wireless network, replacing uh, the uh, uh, batteries and the switches, and, and, and buying some new switches to replace aging uh, switches. Um, the dynamics are total cost of $29,000, and, and we're paying 5800 It's a 580787 uh, in order to, uh, to get that. Yeah. So I, yeah, I get the whole you know the battery thing is essential. Uh, the network switches, AJ, yeah, certainly makes sense. The expanded capabilities uh, by increasing the, the the additional items is a, probably nice to have, but the fact that you're getting it at a pretty good cost seems to be, you know, it's like, why not? <laughs> In my mind, it's what we call yeah. a no-brainer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? No. Okay, uh, can we have a roll call on that? Yeah. Yes, Carolyn? Um, yes. Dennis? Yeah. Diane? Yes. Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Tim? Yes. Okay, next item. Uh, Carolyn, I think you've made a request that a couple of committees may uh, form. Um, I looked at the bylaws, and under the bylaws, it is the president's responsibility to appoint any committees. Um, I, so that's my decision to make. I, I don't make that decision in a vacuum. I did talk with some of the other board members who have been on committees in the past and asked if they thought it would be appropriate to, to form such committees. And, and, and generally, I, uh, based on that advice and my own opinion, I, I think not. I think that um, it really is up to our director to make personnel decisions and to um, run the programs uh, of this library. So I'm not, I'm not going to form committees for that reason. And another reason is, and I discussed this months ago when we started the year, um, I just don't know that committees work well when everyone wants to hear it, everything about it anyway. Um, and if the 
if there's certain information that's requested or presentation that's made, if the staff has to present it to the committee, and then the rest of the board wants to hear it anyway, they have to repeat it all. So it just isn't really an efficient way of handling business unless you have a certain matter where only a few people are interested in it and nobody else really wants to know all the details and is willing to accept the recommendation of the committee, which I don't think applies in this situation either. Um, so at this point, uh, I'm not going to appoint any committees. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't discuss these issues in the future, but I'm not going to appoint any committees. I have a question. You can ask a question. You, the committees you would have appointed are called subcommittees, correct? Generally, yes. And they're usually for a specific reason. Usually, yes. I was asking if we could create standing committees something that's not for one specific reason, but for a purpose. Mm -hmm. The reason I mentioned personnel, um, we, we seem to have a hard time reviewing our staffing, and I, I brought this up a hundred times, I'd like to be able to review staffing based on measurement, trying to determine um, what their objectives are and the results and how this benefits this department. Um, and I have to say, I'm concerned that although Susan's the director, I don't think in the scope of staffing there's any type of um, identification in terms of staffing with hours for this particular purpose or that project. And we hear how costly our payroll and benefits are, but we don't have any measurement in place to even identify our, our events, our programs, anything. Um, as a matter of fact, um, you all are aware of my FOIA request for Phantom Fest. I asked for the um, employees and the hours they worked to prepare for Phantom Fest and the day of the event. Well, there are no records that are kept that would indicate the staff and their hours at Phantom Fest or any time spent to prepare for the event. Now, this is just the way we function. It's a very costly way to operate a library. I, I, I don't know. I mean, the staff members were here anyway, and you know the fact that they might have been working on Fandom Fest here and there, I, I don't think that this library is required to... I mean, library employees don't bill hours like law firms do, for instance. Uh, Dennis is here, and he has to charge everything he does to a certain client. But... Library no. employees don't have to do that. They're not required to sit there and mark down every okay. quarter hour or what project no, they're working but, on. You know, but I mean, that's I sort think, of what you're asking for. No, you're I asking think, and you know, and I think the problem is, time. I think the problem is, unless you've been responsible for employees and projects and outcomes, this sounds so out of touch. Of course, the employees in the library should be accounted for, just like in a law firm or in a manufacturing company, you have to be able to figure out your costs. How do you determine if, if an event was even feasible? I, I just don't so because people are just works. in the library, it doesn't matter what they're doing with their time because we have to pay them anyway, that's, not, that's sort of irresponsible. But anyway, that was my purpose for not a committee that would be dissolved or that would be well, here we, for one know, reason. We have had uh, long-standing committees in the past, uh, but that were ultimately uh, dissolved because I, I think they were thought they weren't working particularly well. Or again, the staff was going to having to re uh, repeat information for both the, co for the committee and for the uh, board as a whole. That wouldn't have been the purpose of the committee I had in mind, but um, I understand you're not interested in it, and that's fine. Um, all right, okay, let's move on to number 10. Do we have any unfinished business? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, yeah, we started talking about that. We didn't really finish it. H. That's information on the library and the sales tax. Um, Tim or Greg, library, the friends meeting I attended, which wasn't an official meeting because they didn't have a form. Uh, one of the friends asked if the library should be paying sales tax for the ongoing uh, friends, uh, 
with the animal and books out. Probably going to sell or have a great. And I said, you know, I really would sell it. I would flush it. But I would uh, research it and find out. So I did find out. Unfortunately, the friends didn't have another meeting because they canceled that due to the Cubs game. So I wasn't able to respond to them on that. But in my research, I found uh, documentation that said uh, legislation requires sales tax to be done if uh, the sale is an ongoing sale, not just uh, one once a month or you know even once a quarter or whatever it is. But if it's an ongoing endeavor, and that is to uh, make it um, fair to other uh, businesses that do the similar um, sales. Like another bookstore. Another bookstore, right, right. It, it would be unfair if the library is doing the same business that another business is doing, and the library is not, not collecting sales tax. Or, or, or any, any um, organization, really. So the book sale, you only sell books a book? No, it's an ongoing. 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 It, it is an ongoing book sale. There's a carol down yeah. there where you can always pick a book up. Yeah, right. Buy it if you want to. So in that case, you don't have to. You do have to collect sales tax, right? Yeah. So I'm just giving you the history here. Yeah. So, so what I found, um, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, you know, but I found uh, documentation that said you were supposed to. I forwarded it on to Susan and Greg, who. Consulted with Dennis and then consulted with our accountant, uh, and we found that apparently we should be collecting sales tax for our ongoing sales. It's <laughs> pretty much the gist of it. Um, we have to now, uh, in our due diligence, we have to go back to the point where the library took over the sale, the ongoing sale, and um, do an adjustment to the to the feds. I guess it's feds. Would that be two so years? State. Uh, it go, yeah, it's a little more than two years. Uh, we we stopped sending uh, sending the book sale month to and uh, June of uh, 2015. So starting on July 1st, 2015. Oh, okay. Uh, I I took a look at all of the uh, amounts that were charged uh, to those accounts and tax effective them, and it looks like the total liability is somewhere in the neighborhood of $4,000. Um, yeah, so we have to go back uh, to, to uh, July of uh, 2015. I've already contacted uh, uh, the state. I had a direction, direction from uh, our attorneys and set up uh, an account and uh, you know, uh, would like you to direct us to uh, go ahead and complete those filings and, there was permission to write impress checks to cover those as we complete them. And then we'll present, you know, present a list of those checks to the board. You're going to do that at a future board meeting, is that correct? Yeah, at the next board meeting. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah. be, uh, right. we'll, uh, you know, I, there, uh, there, may be, uh, there may be some penalties and interest. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is that uh, you know, the state can be a little mushy on penalties, but not on the interest. Mm -hmm. So what they may do is charge us interest back to uh, July of uh, 2015 when we took it over. Right. Okay. Um, do we have any duty to report to the state that the friends failed to pay tax for decades? Uh, at some point, uh, they may ask us, uh, why not? What should we do before? Mm -hmm. uh, or something like that. We'll have to, you know, it's our duty to answer truthfully uh, that uh, there was uh, a 501c3 that was running the sale prior. So, like a Cub Scout, if Cub Scouts are doing a, a big sale of stuff, they get charge and go. Yeah, so, the, so the difference is the Friends used to have a sale that ran um, maybe once a year, twice a year. Mm -hmm. They'd take all the books, put them all together, you know, maybe in a large meeting room or something, and invite people in, and they'd get a big blowout sale. Yeah. Then everything else would be packed up and put away until the next sale. Okay, so it wasn't an ongoing. It wasn't. Like that time. It wasn't. Yeah. About, yeah. Ten yeah. Years ago, okay. about ten years ago. About ten years ago, what happened is they started uh, doing it on a daily basis. And I believe at first it was pretty small. You know, it was maybe uh, a hand truck or two, uh, a cart or two of, uh, of books that people would produce. And, and as time passed, it yeah. became more formalized. Yeah. And with the last renovation. We created uh, the corner that's downstairs uh, yeah. adjacent to the cafe yeah. that has five ranges of books. And we've outgrown that with all the materials and we have some additional 
parts there. Uh -huh. um, the yield is about $1,400 or so uh, a month, which is about you know, $16,000 uh, a year on average. Um, you know, you could take that number, you know, and go back in time with it, and, but I don't know, you know, what the, you know, what the actual curve looks like. You know, I know right now it's kind of flat yeah. at about 1400 a month, um, which would be about 140 or so. The tax rate is 10.25% of miles. At the end of 2015 um, is when it went to 10.25, I believe it was 9.25 or 9.75, I can't remember which, in 2015 and uh, before. So we'll pay a, the appropriate tax rate for the time okay. that you know, the amounts were actually uh, uh, earned. So. I was wondering if you had occasion to look into whether or not it makes sense for us to do this continuously. I understand we do derive some revenue from it, but it, but it does it make any sense for us to just sell the books at special events or only certain weeks or you know if we closed it down for a day would it be not continuous Let's throw a blanket over it yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge uh, there's a huge volume of materials and what do you mean volume of materials um books cds that are purchased like, no that enter the sale okay and what we would have to do is find a place for those mm -hmm. and we really don't have Mm -hmm. That's partly why we went to the continuous sale, is that it was boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes. Okay. And do we have a sort of steady outflow of things that people are purchasing? Yeah, I think so. Handled by the volunteers and yeah. the whole process for it. Okay. okay. Uh, the other possibility would be to stop charging people for those materials and make it a donation. I think it would probably take a pretty good bite out of our income. Out of that income. But that would be the, as I understand from your memo, that would be the thing. Mm -hmm. hmm. But they're not located in such a way you can cover it, like she said. A one day a week. Well, I, 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 you know, I think it could be you Yeah, oh, I, I think, the, the, all right, all right, I I think the spirit is it. if it's once a year or twice a year, well defined. Correct. Okay. That's occasional. All right. Anything more than that, you know, covering it, pretending. Right. Okay. Okay. That's right. <laughs> well, That's good try. That's good try. That's good try. Yeah. <laughs> good try. Right. And we still have to show it. You know, store yeah, and that's a lot. Okay. So, uh, back to the friends. You know, they've got an issue. Yeah. They've got an issue. They should have documentation and records of how much money they've received from the library. Yeah. For all those years, and they should be able to figure that out. That's I'm just I'm talking to some more staff. Maybe the library can get the interest back. I yeah. see that is not our. No, it's, yeah. it, is not our it is not our responsibility. That's right. Nice to investigate and work. Yeah, but as, as I said earlier, I'd, uh, I'd like you to, you know, if you're of a mind to, to direct us to uh, complete the filings and satisfy the application yeah. yes, please. as quickly as possible. Please do that and uh, bring us at the next meeting the, the you know, whatever interest well, charts we are. Well, um, we're going to pay the amount of taxes calculated and owed, and we'll leave it to the state. To They'll help let you know. And, yeah, and do the calculation. Okay, so we'll prove that the amount that's owed to the state will prove that next month in the bills? Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, all right, I think this was just an informational item. I don't think we need any motion on this or anything at this point in time, correct? And so we'll move on to the next matter, which. As, yeah. long as, as long as Craig understands that he's got direction from the board to move forward with the process with the state, which I think he did. Yep. All right. Okay. to discuss and approve, I have discussion and approval of the trustees' recommendations of budget review procedures to be utilized in preparation of the 2018-19 library budget. We mentioned we put it on the November agenda and anyone could bring suggestions how they might want to handle the budget review process. 
Okay, all right. I think that is correct. Did we say November? I know we have the audit in November, right. too. Are there any other things that we have to deal with in November? I just don't want to load up we one month We did pick too much. November because we were concerned it was getting pushed away too far. I think right. yeah. Tim mentioned that as well. Uh, all right. Okay. Time. Okay, and then I have another thing. Um, I would like to request that when the video goes out like it did last month, Goes out, you mean? Yeah, it, it's, work? it stops. We lost the final hour of, through a, oh. it was a three hour meeting and we lost the third hour. Okay. And we've lost a couple in the past, I know. Um, but Susan was able to provide me with an audio copy. And when I put it in my computer, it actually comes up like as if it, I was on, on the website. So, what I was going to ask you when something goes wrong that it cuts off, could this audio be uploaded as like part two? Yeah, I, mean, I did actually uh, already ask marketing to do that because I do think the complete meeting should be there, even if it's just a okay. Because you screen. can hear. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. So that was that was two. No, I agree with you. That should be there. And then my third thing was I got this gala invitation in my board um, yeah. information yeah. dropped off at the what library. Is there a purpose okay. for this, or do we have a? Don't really feel about it. Is there, are we doing anything about this? Or? What is it, I, don't I think they were personal invitations to this, yeah. To, I mean, to the oh, things. is that what it is? So as a library board, we're not getting involved with Gala? What? The Gala invitation at St. John Brebuff's <laughs> dinner <laughs> and <laughs> auction. Yes, I think that was an individual decision. Okay. Sorry. Just yeah. wanted to know what I thought. I thought it was a general. I thought it was a general. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, okay, was that it, Carolyn? Yes, thank you. All right, unless there are any other... I items. have one thing, oh. just one real quick. Okay. Uh, I have a contact at the village, and when she asks me to do something, <laughs> the <laughs> that, I do uh, it. their contact will be unnamed. If you take your, uh, this is a, a little uh, a note from their contact regarding the Holly Jolly that the contact wished I would give to each trustee. <laughs> She shall go Okay, all right. Uh, unless there is uh, anything else, uh, I'd like a motion to adjourn. Do I motion? I Wait, that's a motion. Oh, a second. motion? Second. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Karen? Yes. Karen? Yes. Yes. Yep. And Patty seconded. Okay, second, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, Diane. Okay, Patty. Are you asking me yes? Okay. Linda? Yes. 